We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And we hope everybody enjoyed our special second episode. Uh, came out on Monday, our interview with Todd Welty from Harmon. And uh, Tom and I very much enjoyed that. Hopefully Todd did as well. Well, I, I think the end of the interview was most telling when he was, and he said, well, I, it was a lot more fun than That's I thought right. it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, I thought you guys were going to ambush me. I'm like, first of all, I don't know why you would think that. We are certainly very nice people and and enthusiasts. And second, uh, you know, we just want to get information nope. <laughs> from the horse's mouth, so to speak. You know, we want to know uh, more about stuff, just like uh, we keep telling everybody else. Everybody comes to this podcast. They're looking for knowledge, and we search for it as well. So it was a lot of fun. He's a nice guy. Yes, uh, for sure. Very easy to talk yeah. to. Definitely um, hope we can we can uh, have him back again, as we alluded to, talk all about headphones, which I'm sure we can fill up an hour. So, <laughs> Oh, an hour. Jeez. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that, you know, f- for me, at least, I try to, to do is make sure that we're not leaving anybody buried in acronyms right. and stuff like that. So we did try to go back through and uh, clarify everything. <laughs> I tried to make sure that we did that. There's a, a wealth of information on the show notes right. with links to papers and stuff like that. But if you want to see the very specific graphics that Todd is talking about, it's best just to head over to YouTube and check Agreed. that out there because that that's the easiest way. Because in the show notes, it links you to the paper yeah. and I tell you which one to get. But you're not necessarily it's following just, along with the words he's saying. Yeah, so, yeah, it's not even close. So there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of stuff there that you'll have to to. It's just easier to go to YouTube. So on one time I'll tell you to go to YouTube. I'm not <laughs> I'm not baiting you into anything. I'm not trying to get you to press like or subscribe or any of that garbage. Though I did notice we have like 1,900 subscribers, which I think is pretty. Yeah, good. some of that's fake threshold? because some of that was when we were begging to get us up to a thousand, so that you know the. When that right. whole thing was happening, the affiliate program or whatever the heck, uh, YouTube partner program. So yeah, some some of that subscriber number is fake. <laughs> yeah, but I was nineteen hundred. I mean, at least at least a thousand. Well, I think it actually. I think we're actually yeah, just crossed two k, including our fake ones. Do we really? Yeah, at YouTube. Oh, good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I know I subscribe to us like yeah, three. That's times. right. <laughs> All right. This is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You can go to AV Rant to leave us a comment there. Facebook.com slash AV Rant podcast. YouTube.com slash AV Rant. Contact Rob directly at Rob at AV Rant.com. His Twitter is at First Reflect. I'm Tom at AV Rant.com. My Twitter is at AV Rant underscore Tom. But if you want your question answered, you'll email it to question at AV Rant.com. Yes, because that's, we are done trying to get it i did not wrangle sources. twitter at all this week you you get answered on twitter usually you. if you twitter me but uh but uh, i'm not putting it on the topic list unless it's something that no. i definitely want everyone to hear uh speaking of something everyone uh wanted to hear from me uh no i didn't get around to installing those uh pc 4000 amplifier upgrade kits <laughs> just yet i apologize for that um no, I won't promise next week. If I promise, then I will do it, but I won't promise because I am not sure I'm going to get it done. Uh, but I, I, I'm I, looking forward to it. Uh, I'll let everybody know when it is done. <laughs> okay. Very yes. exciting. And I haven't heard nothing from Gick. I ordered... Uh, uh, those sound absorbers. Yeah, well, that's that's actually yeah. My, Michael's in the same boat as part of our, our listeners of the week. So uh, yeah, that's okay. Well, let's yes. talk about that when we get to it. All right, uh, listeners of the week to become a listener of the week to support the podcast in some way. You do that by going one way to do that is going to avrant.com, click on the buy us a cup of coffee link, and go, that takes you to a PayPal donation site. Uh, there you can use your PayPal or a credit card, and we don't see any of the numbers but uh they will send us some of the money and keep a little bit for themselves so we want to thank dan jose and nathan mm-hmm. for doing that this week thank you dan thank you jose and thank indeed you dan jose and nathan thank you very much for the paypal donations really appreciate that and if you want to be a continuing sub- supporter of the podcast go to patreon.com slash av ramp podcast and sign up there a dollar a month is the minimum i believe 
and uh, infinity dollars mm-hmm. a month is the maximum, yeah. is my understanding, though I don't know how you type that in. Yeah, patreon.com so a... slash podcast if uh, anybody would like we to are... sign up for an ongoing uh, automatic monthly donation. Yeah, we have 126 mm-hmm. now, so thank you to all of you patrons. Yep, it ticked back up over 125. Nice to see. 126, Woo-hoo. thanks so much, patrons. <laughs> there we go. Uh, if you can't support us financially, we understand. Just do something. And let us know what you did so that we can talk about it here. And we're going to do that now. Jason, uh, his daughter just graduated college for a graduation gift. He got her a Yamaha YSP 5600 digital sound projector and told Accessories for Less we sent him their way. He also told Gick via their customer survey that he found them because of us. Michael talked us up to Gick while ordering tri-trap bass traps. And he just a heads up that Gick is still backed up on orders with a one to two month wait times right now. Wish I would have known that. Well, I would have ordered it anyways. I was making a difference. I mean, let's so be yeah, uh, <laughs> it, do that, that is. I mean, obviously, else. that's not their goal. Um, it's it, they they had a, a rough go of things in COVID times. Uh, they have not caught back up yet. Uh, I mean, it's supply, it's ability to have workers on site, it's all of those things yeah. that they are still recovering from. So, uh, if you can bear with them, uh, we still support them very much. But yeah, do be aware that uh, that's not the place to order if you're in a rush right now. Right. Uh, I remember when Gick was a dude in his yeah. garage. <laughs> I remember when he was on the forums <laughs> posting that like he was going to start doing this. And he's, he's really made it work. So, and I, yeah, you got to give everybody a little bit of slack during when you, especially when you're having something that's essentially made by yes. him. But <laughs> you know? uh, thank you to Jason and thank you to Michael for talking us up to, let's see, accessories for less uh, for Jason and Gick and my, uh, Gick for uh, Jason and Michael. Yeah. Uh, Bertrand sent Rob an Amazon he gift card. Indeed, thank you, Bertrand. So, and Nicholas over at Linus Tech Tips got in touch with Rob through James, as one of our listeners, and asked some questions about DLP projectors. He included a very nice shout out to AV Rant at the end of their YouTube video about the Optima UHD thirty. Uh, I guess projector. That's so, right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Linus. Linus Tech Tips. They've got like two million subscribers. So yeah, if we get it start we'll, getting we'll, inundated, we'll, we'll know why. <laughs> Yeah, that's unlikely. That. The, our production values on their videos right. just not quite Definitely up to Definitely not um, up to a site where that that is what they do. Linus Tech Tips makes yeah. YouTube videos. That's how they make their revenue. That's how they pay for their jobs. That's what they do over there. I'll be honest with you. If Rob and I were in the same town and could do this like face-to-face, uh, our video production quality would be infinitely better. Would we it would, now? We, we, I think we could. I, I think we I would. I don't think it would be a whole lot different. <laughs> oh, I think it would be told. Well, I mean, maybe not during COVID, but, you know, during we could put a plexiglass. Ah, between this. Anyway, thank you to Nicholas. Really thank you to James. Works, thank but... you to Linus. Nice to have that shout out. Yeah, not Linus. It's Nicholas. <laughs> I, said, I said all three of their names. Oh, <laughs> they all oh, work over is, there. OK, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> Dan sent me some photos to use for on AV gadgets, which I haven't looked at yet, but I just saw that I got mm-hmm. them today. So I will. And we got some notes of gratitude from Rob K. Andrew, Patrick, Dan. Uh, Cameron, Christian, Jason, Nathan, Jonathan, Nathan, Vince. Uh, Vince says he really appreciates we've never pl- pl- put any content or answers behind the paywall. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <I'm>, okay. <laughs> Wayne Gerinder breaks his heart when he hears a Canadian pronounce their letter Z as a Z. I don't understand what instead that means. Instead of Z. And Jason. <laughs> Oh, instead of Zed. Yes. He see. wants to hear Zed, and but yes, uh, Rob, Andrew, Patrick, Dan, Cameron, Christian, Jason, Jonathan, Nathan, Vince, Wayne, Gerinder, and Brian. Yes, I, I threw everybody in there who just said a thank you. Uh, it's because I appreciate the notes of gratitude and encouragement. It is uh, much appreciated during this time. And uh, yeah, Gerinder, uh, most of our listeners are in the U.S., so I try to make them feel comfortable. Call it Z. I like H a lot. <laughs> we don't say H. I don't Canada. know why. <laughs> That's a I know. I, That's a I like some H. parts of Britain thing, not all. <laughs> the Australians loved saying ah. H. They loved doing anything that made them sound less Isn't it less like American. the people who typically don't pronounce the H in words who call the letter H H for some reason? <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? All right. In the news, as we predicted after we mentioned Kef's new Unicor dual post space saving driver design last week, they've announced their first product with, that uses Unicor, the Kef. KC62 uh, sub. It's a 10 inch cube with a thousand watts, a uh, thousand watt amplifiers. That's technically two 500 watt right. amplifiers, whatever. And dual opposed five, uh, six and a half inch drivers that they claim can play down to 11 hertz. 
that's at minus 3 dB. Uh, I have no reason to think that that's not true because it's 105 dB max yeah, output. From so, one meter away. And exactly, and exactly uh, shaking your pants. It's leg, not 115 but, uh, dB full reference uh, low frequency effects right. level. Uh, and also no idea at what distortion level because they might be pumping yeah. the heck out of that amplifier and those uh, drivers to get it out that loud. But uh, yeah, there you go. I think it would be worth seeing, yeah. though. I mean, the, the drivers going in and out of that thing kind of right. makes me think of those squeezy toy things. But it's like 1500 bucks for the sub, which is not too bad considering the size of it. It's so small. And it has decent output. Mm-hmm. But like we said, you can have low and loud. You, you can have small. Or you, and you can have cheap. And you can you can only have two of those. <laughs> so they they didn't go with the cheap. Nope, they did <laughs> so, not. <laughs> 1500 bucks. it's small. And it plays pretty low uh, at a reasonable volume. I mean, it's, this would be... All those people who ask us, you know, I'm in a very small right. room and I need a very small sub. What do I buy? I have no problems pointing people towards sure. this. It is expensive, right. but it's not that expensive. Uh, AMC Theaters will avoid bankruptcy after restructuring its debt and leveraging equity to raise $917 million. Who is giving them money? Who? I don't know. They are counting on successful vaccinations, allowing them to fully reopen later this year. Carl, <laughs> they're like, we voted for Biden so hard. Uh, Carl is interested to hear how we think things might play out, especially with so many blockbuster movie titles now being offered via streaming services at home. Dude, the minute that it looks like theaters are going to fully reopen, fully expect Warner Brothers to go, ooh, joking. Yeah. <laughs> We're not doing that anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, The Matrix isn't supposed to come out until December. I'm like, yeah, I can see them being like, mm, yeah, I mean, it'll be on HBO nah. Max eventually. I have no doubt of that. Yeah. Uh, but whether yeah. it'll be day and day. Even if they just delay it a week, I think that would be I enough honestly for think them that to... w- once, once the general feeling across the globe, more or less, is that we really are back to some amount of safety. I, I honestly, honestly believe people will flock back to theaters. I think people... Oh, are, it's going to be the roaring 20s all over I think over again. many people are eager to go back to theaters. Uh, I think uh, live performances will get a, a big, big jump. I, I think big people boost. are really eager to do it. Uh, so I'm not fearful that that people are just never going to go back to the movie theater um it, i think it right. will take feeling that we are safe uh but we do have vaccines out they are rolling out maybe it is a bit slowly and and not exactly being handled perfectly at the beginning here but that that will improve throughout this year and yeah. i do think we'll get yeah. this uh get this under control so that's my prediction yeah i agree completely i think that uh i think we're going to see a massive uptick in Things like travel yeah. and uh, any sort of uh, group events that you, that things people haven't been able to do for yep. over, I mean, pretty getting, getting close to a year now, but uh, it's going to be well over a year before most of us get uh, our vaccines. Uh, those of us that are willing to take them, I don't know. <laughs> Well, it's I, still I mean, way I, faster I, than ever anticipated. I mean, we didn't think we would even have a vaccine until a vaccine. 18 months after the thing began at the earliest. Now it's looking like we might actually have a significant amount of the population vaccinated by 18 months right. because we, we basically got the vaccine I know, in a year. So that's amazing. I mean, the, the minute that I get my vaccine, uh, the, the second dose, uh, I mean, I'll still be wearing a mask because that's what we yep. have to do until enough people get there. But uh, I'm going to be... I'm going to be much more comfortable going right. out and being with people and inviting people over and having people inside the house. I haven't had anybody inside my house for that wasn't working yes. on it uh, <laughs> since this thing started, really. I mean, I except to go to the bathroom when because we all sit outside and have, uh, you know, we'll have one couple over or one family over and we'll all sit outside socially distanced doing our thing. And then people wear masks when they go in the house to go to the bathroom. And they come right back out and that's it. So it'll be great to actually have a dinner party again. Right. That's what I'm. Yeah. You know what? I'm so I mean AMC there. I keep telling everybody <laughs> I keep telling everybody I'm throwing the birthday party when uh right. when everybody gets their vaccine. I'm like they're like for who? I'm like all yep. of us. <laughs> it's all <laughs> you come our in, rebirthday. You, you get you get a cupcake. Everybody sings happy birthday to everybody, mm-hmm. and because we all missed one, at least one during this. So uh, yeah, we're all having a birthday party. It's going to be a big birthday party. Yeah. So AMC is taking a little bit of a gamble on this. They're they're counting on it. I mean, even though it's nearly a billion dollars, this is really only going to sustain them for about a year's worth. Uh, you know, with nobody coming in, they're, they they said they're at like minus ninety eight percent of where they would normally be. Right. So um, right. Yeah, yeah, let's uh, let uh, fingers crossed for them. I I. Think Think and hope that gamble will pay off. Yeah. So the name change from CBS All Access to Paramount Plus. Mm-hmm. Oh, what up, God. Gotta be. Gotta join the bandwagon. 
Thanks, Disney, with your stupid plus crap. When are we going to get Netflix plus? Uh -huh. Anyways, uh, Paramount Plus happens in uh, March 4th. Only the U.S. gets all the additional content right away, though. Other countries have to wait until their plus comes. Well, I mean, we get the name change. We just don't get the content. <laughs> hmm. The latest Xbox updates have properly fixed the Ultra HD Blu-ray player app. No more raised or crushed blacks and added HDR support to YouTube. So Yeah, it's kind of cool. Whoopee. Strangely, the PlayStation 4 supported, uh, I think... Yeah, PlayStation 4 Pro supported HDR on YouTube, but the PlayStation 5 doesn't yet. Weird stuff going on. But uh, Xbox oh, oh, One I... X and S and Xbox Series X and S all support HDR on YouTube now. Hooray. Hooray. I watched YouTube on the... Um... Oculus. My son oh, yeah. was my son was my son was doing it and he was just watching like a normal thing. Yeah. Uh but it was it essentially it put a big like a massive screen yeah. in front of you like you like you were sitting in a the theater. I was like, "Yes, this is what right. it should be like." <laughs> Except now I should be able to turn to the side and see <laughs> like the other people that are in there with me and not have but to You see what I mean? It's 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 it should be pretty like, impressive inside the Oculus headset. It's really quite uh, watchable. I, I know. I was I was like, "This is I can yeah. do this." All right, Andrew, this is comments from our listeners. Andrew, our, he's our model spaceship guy, wants to share his DIY absorption panels. He used our suggestions, basically copy Gix DIY frames with their uh, cutouts on the sides. And once he had them mounted with a one-inch air gap, they made a ton of difference, much more than expected. And now all of the reverb and zing is from in his room is gone. It made him rethink doing a speaker upgrade, at least for the time being, and, and it motivated him to connect his newly purchased amplifier and take eight measurements, uh, all the eight measurements that Odyssey allows. So we've got some pictures here, but it's a, essentially a wooden frame, uh, just a you know, normal frame. And he's got cutouts along the sides, like uh, he routed out uh, some long, thin oval cutouts on the sides to allow air mm -hmm. in from the sides as well. So that's Looking good. good and apparently uh, sounding good. Happy to hear about that. Yeah, and this is a, actually a really good point that we should probably make more often on this podcast is you know when people are asking for speaker upgrades mm -hmm. uh the, our first question should be did you treat right? your room yet <laughs> because if you haven't treated your room yet then the speaker upgrade may be not necessary mm -hmm. and certainly not going to give you as good a results as you could have if you had already treated the yep. room you should definitely you know okay you're gonna buy the tv first you're gonna get the speakers you know and the seating and all that and that point is when you start putting treatments up on your rooms before you start upgrading everything else, uh, at least in my opinion. So there we go. Uh, okay, so questions now. Bertrand, uh, again, we skipped him because the man is the soul of brevity. Uh, je suis... What? Je suis de je suis retour. De... I'm back. Okay. <laughs> I'm back, he says. All right, whatever. Tom said Bertrand used up all his questions when he went uh, up to J or K or something, but he's willing to admit he's kind of OCD about the setup, so he's got more. And believe me, I think he goes even past eh, we're J up to J again. Time, his... <laughs> J, all right, whatever. His local dealer was going to have him buy AudioQuest ca cables. Go read the article. Your high-end cables are hurting your sound ah, on AV Gadgets. Okay. Just read it last week. I am on a tear. There are like four articles in queue right now that are all slamming high-end audio. <laughs> I am not sure they'll all get published because I think some of them are just a little too mean. But uh, something got me got in my craw last week, and I started writing a bunch of stuff. So I'm going to have to space them out with other articles in between. So it's not just... And another thing. All right, anyways, AudioQuest cables. It seems like we would not agree, you think? So in Canada, what should you get instead? He does want to have HMI 2.1 with an 8-foot uh, length for one of the runs. And what about speaker wire? Literally any speaker wire <laughs> will do. Just about. <laughs> like go to Home Depot you or could. whatever you're at, the Canadian equivalent, and just get 14, 16 gauge. Doesn't really matter. They're not running at 1,000 feet, so who cares? Uh, and then interconnects uh, the rest of that stuff. I mean, I don't. Do you guys have mono price? Well, what we have is Prime there, Cables, PrimeCables.ca, uh, which resells mono yeah. price at very reasonable prices. They also have their own branded stuff and other not too expensive, but perfectly reasonably manufactured. So Prime Cables is where I would point any Canadians uh, to get almost everything. The one thing you did mention though is an ultra high speed HDMI cable. Yeah, uh, that. For some reason, uh, our Best Buys don't have the Rocketfish uh, official certified ones that they have at the United States Best Buys, but uh, we do have 
um, cables available at Amazon, which are officially certified. So uh, yeah, you can get those from Zeskit. Zeskit is the uh, brand name there. Uh, they don't have exactly an eight foot. They have a 10 foot though. So at, at a perfectly reasonable price. I, I was on Blue Jeans Cable's website this week looking at something else, and I was looking at their high speed cables. I think they're certified now too. They might be. I, think I haven't I saw checked a two point one just lately. Oh, they might be. Okay. I think I think if you go to Amazon and you look at Blue Jeans Cables, their their high speed cable, you'll see a picture of the cable, uh -huh. and then you'll see a picture of the certification. I mean, I know they have people. high speed like the, premium, but I don't know if they have ultra high speed certified. Yet, right. So well. We'll have, we'll have to check, to check that and get back check on to that. You. It, it will but, be yeah. the case at some point. Somebody listening to this in the future, it will definitely be true that Blue Jeans Cable is yeah. ultra high speed certified because they're working on it if it isn't already. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, they're probably just taking the cables they already made and said, I bet these sure. work. Sure, <laughs> but I can I can point you right now for sure to Zeskit from Amazon.ca. Uh, yeah. Those ones will work for that. And then, yeah, Prime Cables for pretty much everything else. I did not make enough coffee. Ah, okay. <laughs> mm. I also drank half my water before we started the podcast, uh. so I might be taking a break at some point in the middle of this question, more likely. He asked, should he get banana plugs both ends or just the receiver ends? Um, banana plugs, for those of you that don't know, uh, are essentially, if you look at this, you know, the, the speaker terminals, the back of your receiver on the back of most uh, uh, most speakers, you know, they have the, the screw-in mm -hmm. thing, and then it has a hole in the back. Well, the banana plugs just stick into That's that right. hole. The upside of banana plugs is they make a very secure connection if you have, if you get the right uh, banana plugs. I mean, some, they, sometimes they make such a secure connection that they'll pull this terminal <laughs> out before they'll actually disconnect. Uh, but uh, the the downside and, and, and well, the upside is they make a secure connection and they're very easy to swap right. out. You know, they're very easy to switch. The downside is that they stick out like Wavar for the most part. They have uh, they 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 stick out the back of the receiver, so they have you know this kind of extra mm. length. That goes uh, extra depth of your receiver and your speakers. If you want your speakers close to the wall, right. or you want them, you want your receiver. Your receiver barely fits into your cabinet. Banana plugs aren't for you. So, uh, first question you have to ask yourself is, how am I going to mount these things? You know, do I need? Do I can I? Do I even have space for the banana plugs? Number one. Number two. How often are you switching stuff up? I guess because <laughs> if you're only <laughs> if you're only gonna do this once, yes, the bare wire termination is a pain. Yeah. And I hate doing it, but uh, after it's done, it's done. You don't usually do it. Again, I would recommend you know, at least for to almost years and years. anybody to do bananas at least on the receiver end of things. It is so much like basically yeah. because it's so easy to have one little stray strand that makes its way across and sends your receiver into protection mode, especially when you're starting to connect 11 speakers to the back of one AV receiver. So uh, or nine, I think in the case uh, that Bertrand is going to do. So I would definitely do it on the receiver end. The ones I like are from Sewell, which you can get at Amazon.ca if you're in Canada. I like the Strike the most because they are the shortest as we just talked about it adds the least amount of depth and they're the fastest to install you just have to splay the little copper wire just a little bit and then there's like kind of like a wedge of a, con a conical wedge of uh, copper inside so you, you just put it in there and screw it down and you're done uh the deadbolt the sewell deadbolt is another design where you splay the copper over sort of a rim and then lock it down and that's even more secure um if you do want to have it on the speaker end and you are worried about the depth because you want to put your speakers close to the wall I can recommend the Sewell Deadbolt uh, Spade connector instead of the banana because that gives you the spade connection that goes in at a 90 degree angle to your binding post on the back of the speaker doesn't add any depth to the speaker but still gives you a uh, non bare wire connection but I'm willing to use a bare wire on the speaker end uh, but on the receiver end I definitely recommend having banana plugs. Yeah, I can go with that. Uh, I'll tell. You, I'll just tell you how mine is. Mine is banana plugs on the receiver and bare wire at the speakers, okay. except for the front three. Yeah. The front three have banana plugs as well, but everything else is really close to a wall for the most part, and, or mounted to a ceiling or a wall. For in the case of the uh, uh, the prime elevation speakers, so I you couldn't get. I don't think you can get those even those spade plugs because mm. they have the big round part that you you know, put the wire into. I don't even think those would work in, in those installations. So that's how I do it. You know, it's really what you know, a matter of preference and uh, convenience. I also, I mean, I'll tell you, and, and if, if you feel this way, 
uh, do not feel bad because when I first saw banana plugs, I was like, oh, those look <laughs> cool. I want some of those. And it, you know what? No one sees them but me, but I know they're there and uh, I think they're cool. So that's one of the reasons why I use them. So any problems with using just a simple RCA cable to connect to subwoofer at the back of the room, it'll, it'll need to be over 25 feet uh, as long as it's shielded. So, right. you know, uh, that's the only thing. So literally, if you had like an old, K, you know, like RCA, you know, three cable set, mm -hmm. you know, that they used to come with your VCR and it had a red, white uh, and yellow. You pull off the red and the white and you throw them away and you keep the yellow because the yellow uh, one was for a video and that one was shielded. shielded. <laughs> uh, yeah. And the other two really weren't. So you could you and that we often did say to you, you could just use that if you want to. So as long as it's shielded, it doesn't you'll be you'll be fine. And you can get that at uh, Prime Cables if you're in Canada. They have a I think I don't think they have it exactly 25. I think they have a 30. Uh, that'll work if you're just over 25 feet and totally fine. Yeah. So he hasn't made, his, made up his mind about whether to get the Marantz SR7015 or pay the extra for the 8015. His dealer said he could lend him both so that he can pair at home. Is it critical to have his acoustic panels installed for that addition? Also, should he wait to see uh, the new 2021 release uh, receiver models? Audition receivers? Yeah. Pretty cool of the dealer to let you do that. That is pretty cool, but I will tell you, if you can hear a difference, I got an article that I'm, I just wrote for, that's just for you that hasn't been published yet because it's uh, you're probably not going to really hear a difference there. I would uh, I would look at the feature set and buy based on that. That's what yep. I always say about receivers. You look at the feature set, you look what it does, you look what you want to do, and you match that up. So for me, when I shop for receivers, I look at... Does it, can it power the number of speakers That's I need right. it to power, number one? Number two, does it have the room correction system that I am comfortable with? Is it high enough fidelity on the room correction system? So in, in the case when I was, last time I was looking for uh, receivers, it was uh, Multi-Q XT32 with the sub-EQ whatever. Mm -hmm. I can't remember that thing. And that was the most important thing. And then everything else I didn't give one fig about. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't care if it does Bluetooth. I don't care if it has AirPlay. I'm never going to use those things. I don't care if it connects to Spotify, Connect, or whatever. Don't care about any of that stuff. Match the features with what you want and buy that one. And if you can get one that's cheaper because it's a, it's a lower model and it still does all the things you want it to do, save the money. Don't listen to them. I mean... They don't sound like anything. Right. They shouldn't sound like anything. <laughs> so at the beginning of 2020, uh, there actually were some little mentions about new AV receivers because they were getting hyped about HDMI 2.1, which of course turned out to be a bit of a uh, yeah non-starter this year. But uh, there was some mention of it. There was no mention at all about new AV receivers at CES 2021. Not a peep. Mm -hmm. And that makes me suspect that uh, the new models for 2021, they might not come out until closer to the end of this year. Um, plus there was yeah. that whole AKM fire, which might lead to further delays. So I, I suspect that we're not going to see new AV receiver models, at least not towards the upper end, the 9, 11, 13 channel models. We might see some of the entry level models earlier, uh, but I don't think it's all the fall of this year. So uh, if you're willing to wait that long, I don't have a problem because of the whole HDMI 2.1 situation. Uh, but that, as far as I recall, that wasn't really a priority for Bertrand. Um, and as I recall, he was going for 5.2.4. So there, I, I wouldn't justify the SR8015 because that is a, a 11 amplifiers built in, 13 channel processing model. And if you're going to stop at nine, there's no reason to do it. I would get the SR7015. Strictly speaking, if you were going to critically compare to AV receivers to see if you were able to hear any difference, then yeah, I would want my room fully treated before I did that. But I wouldn't base my decision in this instance on that. I would just just get the SR 7015 no, in all likelihood. There's no, I, there's no force on earth that's going to get me to swap out receivers right. just to just to hear them. There's li there's literally no force on earth that would get me to do that. And I would that. also uh, mention for Canadians in particular that uh, because of the price of the SR 8015 in Canada, I would have a serious look at Anthem's MRX 1140, which can go to 15 speakers. Uh, because, hey, if you're mm -hmm. going to go to 13, why not go to 15? Because in Canada, we get a darn good deal on that Anthem MRX 1140 and actually cost less than the Marantz SR8015 uh, and you get two more speaker channels out of it so yeah if you're wondering what the, what sound that you're hearing right now that's the sound of Rob talking himself into an AV receiver you know what I was I was <laughs> I was really <laughs> that's like trying right hoping that I might get it but I've looked at the manual and I'm like uh, there's still two things holding me back one no curves of equal loudness which I knew about uh, but the other one is uh, it doesn't look like out of the box it's going to have cross pollination of up mixers and no guarantee that anything is up mixing into front wides and that's like a number one thing I want is up mixing into front wides so mm. it might come later but I'm going to have to wait and see 
All right. CES 2021 brought the reveal of the new 83-inch uh, size for OLEDs. He was going to get a pretty good deal on the 77-inch CX. Any clue as to how much more expensive the 83-inch will be? Nope. I mean, Rob probably Well, does. there's a clue, uh, which is that we do know the price of Sony's Master Series A90J 83-inch, which is 8,000 US dollars. Uh, that's compared okay. to 4,500 US dollars for the 77-inch of that same A90J series. Now, Sony's A90J should be right around the same price point probably give or take $500 of the G1 series, the upgraded series uh, from LG, which is almost always $1,000 more than the C series, size for size. Mm. So I would expect that the 83-inch C1 is probably going to debut at $6,000 US dollars, which for the price he was getting on the 77-inch C10 is way more <laughs> in Canadian mm. dollars uh, once, once you do all that exchange. So I don't think it's going to be terribly close. If you can pretty much double what you were going to spend on the 77 inch C10 to get the 83 inch. I think that's what you're looking at. Okay. He's going to have acoustic panels on the side walls, back wall and the front uh, wall behind his front left and right speakers. Is it important to also have a panel behind the TV, maybe for the center? Uh, I mean, it can't hurt, can't hurt, but I don't, I wouldn't bend over backwards I would to play. do it. <laughs> yeah. It's probably, well, I, I don't have one. Neither I do don't I. ever, <laughs> I've never had one back there. Uh, even when I had, well, yeah, I think every single time I've had a, a freestanding TV or a screen that dropped from the ceiling, mm -hmm. uh, I think that there was always a window behind okay. it. And that was that was why I didn't have. Yeah, if yeah. it's easy to do, it won't hurt anything. If it's difficult yeah. to do, don't bend over to do it. It's not that yeah. critical. So should the absorption panels be of various thickness any benefit to making them taller than four feet? Uh, they are four feet because that's the size the 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 insulation the, the comes insulation in. Insulation <laughs> comes in. It comes in four foot by two foot by varying thicknesses. Uh, so two inch thick, one inch thick, four inch thick. I think is generally the mm -hmm. the the way that they make them. So the way you get a taller panel is you put two together. Yeah, like the way I you get a start... thicker panel than four inches is that you start packing <laughs> more of them in. There. I wouldn't start so cutting the are... panels just to make them taller, just for the sake of making them taller. Like I'd go with convenient sizes. <laughs> Right, and that's what they do too. I mean, it's just so much easier just to make a four foot tall panel because yep. you don't have to do anything other than just shove it into the to the the frame that you made. Uh, any benefits to to having them be of varying thickness? Well, you know, the thicker the better, yeah. basically. And the reason why somebody goes with a, a a less thick panel is because they can't fit the more thick panel yep. on there for the most part. I went in my room. I have one four inch thick panel because it's on a side wall. That's away from everybody and uh isn't isn't going to be bumped right. okay by anybody every other panel is either close to well every other panel is either close to where somebody's going to walk in the extra two two inches or they're all two inch panels that extra two inch thickness will make it so that they're more easily bumped mm -hmm. into number one and or that the panels that are around them are all two inches thick because of that reason so putting more four inch thick panels that are right next to him seems weird right so i just made all of them be two inches thick in the rest of the room uh because in the one four inch panel because the sight lines you can't see how deep it is anyways and it just kind of sits there no one's ever said how come that one's thicker than the rest of them <laughs> no one's ever mentioned yeah basically that. if they all could be six or eight inches thick uh that would be like including an air gap like maybe six inches of insulation and a two inch air gap if they all could be that thick that's what we do uh but typically that just isn't going to work in most people's rooms so we we put what we can where we can because something is better than nothing uh but it's not that there's like some optimal mix of different things thicknesses that we're aiming for uh we would make them all as thick as possible uh wherever it you know is logistically makes sense to do so right look at a anechoic chamber and look yeah. how thick those were <laughs> like six feet uh he can make super chunk base traps when for those of you that don't remember what those are, that those are that's cutting triangles of insulation and, and stacking them in your corner all from floor to ceiling but at that size they wouldn't fit all the way up to a ceiling any issue with that with having a gap at the top uh, if it were me and I was in this position, I would prefer to have the gap in the middle if possible. <laughs> I don't think that's uh, the issue. I think it's like a molding, crown molding thing or something like that, or, or maybe a soffit, you know, can't just 
just can't go all the way. Well, the I mean, well, I mean, it seems like you should. Well, okay, I don't, I don't understand how that's either of those things uh, inhibit you from putting more insulation all the way up to the ceiling. I mean, you put it all the way up to the soffit, which is essentially sure. it's it's ceiling, which is fine. Uh, if it's a molding thing, you just cut it out for the molding and then right. still shove it up there until it gets to the ceiling. But let's just say you only had enough insulation oh, to go okay. up, you know, and, and there was a foot left at the top. I'd put that foot in the okay. middle, basically put a shelf so that, because what you want is in that corner, you've got three boundaries right. all together. And you'd rather have that that corner covered than the middle of the wall that has just two boundaries. So if you're going to have a gap, have it in the middle. Uh, if if it's for some of if it if it's there's a soffit up there, we'll just go up to the top of the soffit, and you still three have your three boundaries in Bob's your own. Right. So how do you figure out the precise heights that are needed if he were to add a second row of seats? He's going to have. Uh, He's going to have his track lighting, so it seems fairly straightforward to make sure the projector is low enough that he won't get any shadows on his screen from his lights. But how do you make sure it's high enough not to block the view of anyone in the back row and also make sure that the back row riser is high enough so they can still see the bottom edge of the screen, too? Uh, it depends on the height of your front seats. I mean, you're, that's basically how that works. Um, I mean, the short you know, answer the, is trigonometry and not very complicated yeah. <laughs> trigonometry, very simple trigonometry, <laughs> but that is how you would do it. Uh, drawing yourself an actual like two scale diagram uh, would yeah. absolutely allow you to do this. Uh, but I think the overall advice is don't worry about the back row too, too much. Like if they've got a little bit of the bottom edge obscured by somebody's head in front of them, you'd have that at a movie theater too. Even with stadium seating, you get a little bit of that. So uh, uh, don't drive yourself completely nuts about perfect sight lines. What I would focus yeah. on is that the front row is where you, it, you want it to be, um, like your primary row. And that you then get your projector screen height so that your resting eye line, which... Keep in mind, your resting eye line might be at a slight upward angle if you're always reclined in your seat. But the, wherever your resting eye line hits the wall, that should be one third up the screen, one third from the bottom of the screen. That's where your resting eye line in your main seats should hit. And that allows you to put the screen as high as you would want the screen to be for that front row. Um, so once you have that, then... Just draw yourself a scale diagram and you can use a little bit of trigonometry to figure out, oh yeah, okay, uh, I'll lose maybe a little bit of the very bottom edge, but also keep in mind, 16 by 9 screen, oftentimes watching a movie, that bottom edge is going to be a black bar. So then it really doesn't matter that you've you know got a little bit of somebody's head that's obscuring the black bar at the very right. bottom. That's one thing everybody forgets too. Yeah. Is, you know, like you, you, don't have, you don't often have people in your home theater to sit there and watch you know an episode of... Right. You know, it's always extraordinary playlist or yeah. something like that. You're in there to watch some movie, and it's two, two to three to one, uh, two point three five to one, and you know, there's black bars on the, yeah. the top and the bottom. And if it's so... sports, like, are they really gonna care that a tiny little bit of the bottom has, you know, the shadow of somebody's head in front of them? I don't think so. Right. Uh, I I clicked on the link because I wanted to mm -hmm. see this thing. Um. All right, so he came across the uh, Levington pop-up floor outlet. Since he wants powered recliners, do we think that would be a good solution for getting power to seats that are on, in the middle of the room? Uh, it's always going to be popped up. <laughs> it's just, I mean, it will be always popped up. I mean, the, 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 the simple answer for rec uh, powered reclined seats, if you can have an outlet installed on your floor, pop up or no, mm. you want it to be underneath the couch. And then you plug it in so all the wires are hidden. Like mine, I have a outlet just behind my couch uh, on the wall, sure. but I have to have a power. I have to have a you know an extension cord plugged in so that with you know three outlets because or two outlets because there's two recliners mm -hmm. and you know it, it's just kind of on the floor back there and it, there's no real way of hiding it. I mean, that could hide it, but uh, you would always see something. So if you can do it underneath the the seats that's kind of where you want it to be i don't know that having it pop up really helps anything other than when the are you ever going to unplug them i mean right. <laughs> is that going to be a thing that happens for you I don't, I don't know i just don't see that happening yeah i'm not uh, i'm not familiar with installing them i don't know if the uh, metal backer box that comes with them requires any sort of clearance below it uh, because if you're doing this in a basement you might not necessarily have the floor depth to have the uh, the the electrical box that comes with these because it looks like a fairly decent depth on this thing. Yeah, um, it does really. I mean, it really yeah. looks like it's for a second floor where you're going to have you know proper uh, ten inch ceiling joists below you. So yeah, if this is going in a basement, I is going to be 
protruding and probably not installed correctly. Um, so for that reason, I would just, I would consult your electrician. That's what I would do. If you say, okay, I need to have outlets where I'm not going to be traipsing a cord, uh, you know, across the room to a wall for my recliners, uh, I would hire an electrician to do it properly. If this is what they recommend, fine, but I wouldn't say go and buy these from Amazon and try to do that yourself. Yeah, I agree. All right, finally, that was Jay. So on to Brian. Brian says he appreciates our input two weeks ago regarding his almost triangular shaped room. He says the whole house was actually designed with a nautical theme, hence the circular porthole windows. I had a, I mean, it's not exactly the same, but I had a, a, a school, like a one, one building at the college I went to in New Orleans had like a nautical theme and it didn't have like the design, but it had the numbering on the doors and no one could find anything because <laughs> someone was, someone, you know, the numbers changed from port to starboard and all this other ah, stuff. And I it see. just, it was, it was so bizarre. No one, I mean, getting into your class, like everyone got lost the first day, getting into their classroom and it was just kind of a thing. All right. So he responds to some of the things we weren't sure about. The room does serve more than one purpose, including being an occasional guest room with uh, the seats all lying flat. So they turn to a bed. So Rob's idea of switching to a direct view display on a three in one stand won't work, but the front wall of shelves is actually modular, so he's going to take our advice and get rid of the clip soundbar that's above the screen. He can arrange the front that front wall to accommodate a pair of bookshelf speakers to either side and they center below the screen. Yay. He'll also treat the corners uh, that is behind the seats, as uh, this, as Tom suggested, and that's me. Oh, yeah. And he'll re uh, reposition his surround speakers. So that's good. Yes. We're done. All good there. Congratulations. Go on with your life. <laughs> Oh, no, he has more questions. On the matter of automation, he's a self-professed home automation geek, and he's already outfitted most of the rest of the house, so he completely understands our reaction to how complicated it can get and what a time suck it can be. But he's also already familiar, so he's confident he can handle it in the theater. He's, he's So he's still going to go for motorized drapes, and he's going to completely overdo it with very heavy fabric and 100% pleated fullness so that they can actually provide some absorption he'll go nuts with motorized curtain rods to make sure they can handle the load fine so for about a thousand dollars what we recommend for him uh for new front three speakers he'll be keeping his atlantic technology surround so it'd be nice if the timbre match is reasonable a thousand dollars front three speakers i mean the and if, keeping if in i mind were shopping the, the way that his room is because that's part of it too of course Right. So he's going to get some bookshelf speakers in the center yep. and that he'll somehow get in there. So if it were me, the first thing I would do is go to the accessories for less and see what Kef has on Santa sure. there. Because that would be that would be I my go to. Um, uh, but I would also just look to see what they had and then start doing some uh, searches based on that. Uh, SVS Prime speakers would be on my mm. list. I think they would probably match OK with the with the Atlantic Technologies. Uh my experience with uh, Atlanta Tech is pretty good. Yep, pretty overall. neutral. I feel feel like they they they're, you know, they've never really gone for a sound. Right. So um, I think when I first met Clint, uh, he had Atlantic Tech in his theater, and that was back when uh, whoever it was 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 Dickinson 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 or whatever was designing for them. Is that right? I believe yeah, so. Vance Dickinson. And uh, yeah, the off-axis response of those things were just like. Right. Like you, you could point them at the side walls, and they would still get perfect, perfect timbre. Mapping. Anyways, so uh, I, I like those speakers. Uh, so I would be looking at um, whatever accessories for less has. I would look at uh, prime speakers from SVS. I would look to see what RBH is selling these days, but I don't know what they're selling. Nothing anymore. affordable. <laughs> yeah, they, their their EMP tech line is kind of gone, gone by the yeah. wayside. It seems like the impression and, series uh, they, they, is it hasn't returned yet. Yeah. yeah, we keep hoping. We do. But, uh, you know, and of course, Ascend and... Uh, yeah, well, As a Ascend Hyperion. was my number one thought because these are going in sort of like a shelf setup. Um, and the Ascend HTM200 SE, which I know it's their smallest one. People always kind of overlook it until they get them. And then they're like, Rob, why didn't you hype them up more? They're even better than you said. So I don't know. Can't win for trying. But Ascend HTM200 SEs was really my first thought because first of all, they're going to match timbre wise very nicely with your Atlantic text. And they have the form factor that'll work really well in your shelf setup. They are a sealed design. So we're not concerned about them having them close to the wall or even if they end up sort of like within a shelf space, still going to work really nicely. So they're actually my number one recommendation. Uh, and then 
if you're just used to that horn loaded sound of Klipsch, um, and that's what you want from the front, HSU's uh, horn loaded speakers are something I could recommend. Although they're back ordered and we have no idea when they're coming back in stock. Uh, so that's, that's a bit of a challenge, but those would be my top recommendations. Yeah, it looks like, uh, well, that's a thousand dollars. So that won't work. I'm looking over <laughs> accessories for us right now. They really don't have much for, I guess, the Q150s, sure. or it's or it's going to be too expensive. Mm. You know, those are your options. The Q150s are a perfectly fine. That, speaker, that would be a could, perfectly reasonable choice. Yes. Yeah, and you could just buy three of them or whatever. Perfect tamper match. All right, let me go back. Uh, Bob in the Philippines. On his LG OLED, once every four months or so, he'll turn it on, and the image will be completely out of whack. He sent us an example photo. Uh, which is it? Is this is the is this what it looks this like? This is what it looks like. <laughs> every once in a while, he'll turn it on. Every few months, it's by no means all the time or even all that frequent. But every once in a while, he'll turn it on, and this is what it looks like. Uh, so imagine imagine your TV image. on acid. <laughs> That's what it looks like. Yeah, so negative images, whatever. Yeah. Uh, a simple power cycle doesn't fix it, but fully unplugging and then replugging the TV does. Still, his heart skips a beat every time. <laughs> He'd hoped that the replacement of the power supply in his OLED might fix the issue, but it just hasn't happened. He has full voltage regulation, surge protection, and line filtering. He's pretty sure it isn't the electricity that he's feeding the TV. Is it maybe some sort of issue with the panel refresh that's supposed to run every few hundred hours? Man, that's crazy. This looks... I mean... It, when I glance at it, the first thing I, I think of is a bad cable connection or a bad cable. Well, and I mean... But the, uh, like, it, it's not happening all the time, yeah. which means it shouldn't be the cable. Because if it's a cable, it should happen all the time, not just some of the, the time. The image he's showing is an Android TV interface. So that's not yeah. like the built-in screen. That This is coming from a source. Uh, I would probably guess an NVIDIA Shield. Um, but I I have a slight suspicion i have no idea if this is the case but like the philippines is a little bit unique in that they use 230 volt uh power but at 60 hertz not 50 hertz like mm. most other places that are 230 volt or 240 volt use 50 hertz but not uh, not 60 but the philippines is 230 volt and 60 hertz and then um unlike almost everywhere that uses 230 volt they are ntsc for their televisions, whereas most places that are 230 volt happen to be PAL. Um, and I just I just wonder if there's been some mixing and matching of like what the display does versus what his sources do and what they're expecting. And maybe after it's like after a firmware update of your source, it like reverts to PAL or something <laughs> because that's what yeah. it was expecting. And you, you end up with something strange. I, I don't really think this is something wrong with the TV itself. It, it, to me, it's it's something like that where it's a format, uh, a signal format that's getting mixed up. And because things in the Philippines are a little bit strange compared to almost everywhere else in the world, it's sort of like a mix of different parts of the world that they're using there, uh, that it's, it's more something like that. Uh, honestly, I don't really know. Uh, that would be one to get in touch with LG with if it ever gives you more problems than, you know, just unplugging it and replugging it solves it for another four months. Because if that's what it is, it's not really the end of the world as long as it never gets stuck I, that way. I don't see any way that this, well, unless it's something that's being processed at the TV that is, like you said, breaking. Yeah. Uh, and it's slowly breaking <laughs> somehow. Uh, it, it it seems like what you were saying, it's just like a weird HDMI yeah. power connection error and unplugging it and replugging it just resets everything yeah. it's not like putting this image up on your screen should not hurt your screen no what we're we, the only thing i would worry about is when you can't get it to not put this image yes. on your screen which would mean that there was something wrong with the tv i would reach out to lg they yeah. know you by now That's and right. just send them that picture and say hey this happens every once in a while what what was what what's the deal <laughs> um i would not be surprised if you completely got a new tv and from LG, you know, like the <laughs> replacement model or something like that, if this happened, still continued to happen, in which case it would be, go back to what Rob said. Ralph, excuse me, Ralph got a 75-inch LG UN8500 TV. He tried watching Amazon Prime video using its built-in app, but it buffers every five minutes or so. It happens all the time. Amazon Prime streams uh, perfectly fine on his desktop and on his iPad, so it doesn't seem to be his internet connection or Amazon Prime itself. Only his LG TV has this problem. He's seen other people complaining ab online about LG TV Wi-Fi issues. Is this a known problem? It's not known to me, ah. uh, but it certainly could be the case that you're having 
uh, some sort of interference between if you're using Wi-Fi uh, between your TV and your router mm -hmm. that is causing this issue. If it were me and I could not run a cable, which is exactly what I did. I mean, I took <laughs> this is a cable that goes that. So my router used to live in the garage. So there's a cable that I, it's, it's pinned up to the, you know, the ceiling and I punched a hole in the wall <laughs> to get it to go outside and I tucked it up underneath the eave and then punched a hole in the wall in uh, in the home theater to get it into the home theater <laughs> closet, basically. And, uh, you know, put a little pla the little rubber plastic, <laughs> you know, stopper thing so that, you know, it's not letting in ants or anything. Uh, and I ran my cable. So if you can't do that... Uh, <laughs> What I would do is do one of the, uh, you know, a mesh system, if you can, or some sort of Wi-Fi extender that you plug everything in your home theater into that mm. and then have that connect to your, uh, to your router directly uh, via Wi-Fi. That would be your best chance at fixing this problem if it is, in fact, the Wi-Fi signal um, and the LG just isn't, you know, I mean, they made a TV. They, they weren't exactly spending you know, a bunch of money to get the best antenna in it for the Wi-Fi. So yeah, weak Wi-Fi and LG TVs, the, the current ones going back a couple of years until now. Uh, yeah, seems to be pretty common. It's it's certainly the case with my parents, LG OLED, uh, the, 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 sitting in the corner of their living room. Everything else in the house, no problems with Wi-Fi. They don't have a gigantic house. There's no problems. That TV weak signal from the Wi-Fi yeah. connection. And it is just what's built into the TV. It's a weak Wi-Fi receptor. Uh, seeing those other complaints, not surprising at all. Uh, I'm in an apartment, so I don't really notice it in, in mine. But um, yeah, it, it does seem to be pretty darn common. And it's not surprising at all. I mean, one option, of course, is to just use a separate streaming device because that'll probably connect just fine and no longer rely right. on the built-in apps of the TV. Uh, but if you're like, one of the reasons I wanted it is because of WebOS and I wanted to use those apps, then yeah, I agree with Tom. Uh, get a second uh, router and put it into bridge mode so that you are wired to that, and then that is connecting wirelessly to your your main router. Router. <laughs> Rob, not this one, different Rob. Rob has a challenging room, so he's looking for some help. At present, he's using a Yamaha YSP 5600 digital sound projector. He paired it with an SVS SB16 Ultra Sub do the open concept and roughly 5,000 cubic feet of air. And now he, uh, he wants a proper speaker set up at least 5.1, maybe 5.1.4. The room is sort of L-shaped with the kitchen and dining room taking up the longest 30-foot portion of the room on the, on the right. And then the TV area is a smaller 15-foot area on the left. Excuse me. Ceilings are just shy of 9 feet and all the surfaces are hard and bare. Adding rugs is probably a no-go. No treatments will ever go on the ceiling. <laughs> it doesn't sound like you have a challenging room. It sounds like you're challenging somebody else <laughs> that you're living with. So wall treatments only. And even those are probably just going to be curtains to start. So no wall treatments. Furthermore, the main seat that faces the TV is 14 feet from the TV and right up against a back wall. Jesus. Which is, also has a window. He tried the trick of gradually pulling the seat away from the wall just one inch a day, but he got caught and, and that didn't work. <laughs> he sprinkled dust on it. Oh, no, honey, this is not a new piece of gear. Like, Look at the dust. <laughs> There's a love seat and a three couch, uh, a three seat couch. One is facing the TV straight on, the other is facing sideways because, of course, it is. They can't be swapped, but the three seat they can couch be faces it. The, oh, they can <laughs> yeah, be swapped. I'm sorry, could. but if the three seat couch faces the TV straight on, it ends up pushed against the uh, right against the left wall as well as the back wall. The love seat can have a little bit more room to its left if that's the seat facing the TV. So I'm looking at this thing, this room. It's. Uh, Where's the TV's there? I see it. So yeah, uh, there's a there's a wall on the left with it looks like maybe sliding glass door. There's a window like covering half the couch. There's there's uh, actual the picture half the pictures seat. below that. So yeah, it's a, oh, yeah. a window on the left wall, window on the back wall. Yeah, and uh, the area is sort of uh, the so the 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 bigger couch is on the right facing the window on the left, and the love seat is facing the TV directly in front of it, which is all slammed up against the left wall. All this is slammed up against the left wall, and everything is white. Because of course it is. Mm -hmm. Even the couch seems to be white, or at least a dark, uh, a light, yeah. light brown. Yeah. All right. So yeah, no room treatments, uh, no wall treatments, and curtains aren't going to help you. So 
don't worry about those. So he currently has a subwoofer in the front uh, in the front left corner of his TV area. If he keeps it there, that forces the TV stand below his TV, which is staying over to the right, and he would have to put a bookshelf speaker and his center on the TV stand, which sort of limits his size options. If he were to move his subwoofer to the side wall, he could center the TV stand, which would give him some space on either side to have speakers. He'd be fine with using wall mounts if speaker stands would have too large of a footprint to fit nicely. So is that a good argument for moving the subwoofer to the side wall? Which side wall? I believe below the window, um, as far as I'm aware. You mean pulling it forward on the left wall? Yes, essentially. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't really see that this. I I don't see that this changes much. I mean, <laughs> you if, know, if you either... wall mount bookshelf speakers on either side of the TV, the subwoofer doesn't have to move. Yeah, I agree subwoofer with that. Subwoofer can That's... stay where it is, and the and you wall mount your speakers. That that works. I kind of feel the same. Yeah. I don't see any reason to move anything here. Uh, sonically, we have no idea how to predict what your subwoofer is going to do in that right. corner versus, you know, a couple of feet out underneath the window. And if aesthetically this pleases the person that you're, that, that is uh, dictating the rules in this room, then yeah. I mean, if it were me, I might put the sub in the back of the room, you know, kind of where that little table is or move mm-hmm. the cow, that little love seat over and put it to the left of the love seat in that back corner. At least then you'll get some tactile feeling from it. Uh, I also would have bought a cylinder, but that's just me. <laughs> all right. Uh, given all of those restrictions on placement he has mentioned, how do we think he should lay out his seats, love seat facing the TV or three seat couch facing the TV and seats uh, pushed up against the left wall or the center of the love seat or center of the love seat to the TV so there's a bit of space to the left? Well, I mean, how many people are watching? Because that's how I would, you know, I mean, I if there's three people that want to <laughs> sit, I would put the lo- I would put the couch there. If it's only two people, then I would put the love seat I mean there. I'd rather have a little bit of space to my side for my surround speaker so yeah I- I- if it's mainly two people sitting on a love seat if that'll work most of the time then that's what I would go for and then you can have a little bit of space to your left that'd be my preference so what type of surround speaker should he get bipoles that mount on the back wall or regular monopoles or maybe tripoles that kind of do both and where exactly do we think he should mount them and aim them well we kind of talked about this last week as well um in fact i am in the midst of writing an article about whether or not bipoles dipoles mm. whatever versus monopoles should be used as surrounds and even though i know you're going to go with a five point whatever uh you know, direct firing speakers are now what Dolby and everybody else wants you to use because of Atmos and object-based audio. They just are better at placing things in, in three-dimensional space than the, the more diffuse dipoles, bipoles, tripoles, whatever ones that you do. And you want them to your sides. Uh, in your case, if you put them, I mean, I, you'd have to put them in the, that corner, basically, yep. above your head <laughs> a little bit, uh, or maybe a lot but above your head a little bit and uh, firing directly at each other from either side so yeah i mean i i don't think decided... bipoles make yeah, any sense here because um i mean i do think it makes most sense to i mean i, I would probably install like a little shelf to hold these speakers yes. if you don't have I would too. you know a wall mount but i would install like a little shelf i i do think it makes sense to actually have um you know one that's basically right in that rear left corner and then one that because the window is there would be on the other side of the window it'd be a little bit further away from you but that's fine the channel level is just going to get turned up a little bit on that one compared to the one that's in the left corner but i would have little shelves there installed on the walls and have two regular speakers firing straight at each other um right that's how we do it and in this case it wouldn't matter if you put the shelf on the back wall or on the side wall for that for left the corner. speaker. Yeah, yeah, because it it's just going to be you're going to have the speaker essentially against the wall firing across the couch yeah. because you want it as far back as you can possibly get it. And so you could whichever aesthetically works for you, you just put it on the you know either wall. Just make sure it's in that corner. Yeah, but the bipolar tripod wouldn't make sense to me because those you would pretty much have to put on the back wall, and then you've got like drivers firing at angles, kind of in front of you, and yeah. then like directly into the wall beside you, and then out into your kitchen on the other side. Doesn't make any sense at all to do that design. 
So, uh, wait a second, I scrolled on accident. So if you were to add Atmos speakers, they'd have to be wall mounted, no ceiling mounts, mounting or end ceilings. Would it make sense for to use something like SVS Prime Elevations, maybe on the front wall directly above the front left and right speakers, and then where would they go on the back wall? If it surrounds are on the back wall, would it be weird to have the rear heights act that are, uh, are actually closer to the seats than the surrounds because of the window? Um, I I would not put Atmos in here. I would not do Atmos <laughs> in this room. I just there's wouldn't just, do it. There's just no, there's no, there's no, I can't envision a scenario scenario in which Atmos would be effective in here. Right. Now you could put the front heights. Those work fine. Uh -huh. You know, you could put them up there. Yeah, you can put them um, there. <laughs> uh, but the rear ones, you just, or the top middles or whatever, uh, you just don't. This have is just, space. it's not enhancing what you have. It's, it's just doing it for the sake of doing it. You know what modern AV receivers all have now are the virtual versions. DTS Virtual yeah. X and um, what is Dolby calling it? Dolby Height Virtualization. There, it's the two Whatever. versions of the same thing. I'd go ahead and use that because, you know, it's, it's just applying the HRTF things to the sounds that are coming out of your regular speakers, which is all we pretty much think the upward firing speakers are doing anyway. So, um, yeah. I would rely on that. I wouldn't bother with actual Atmos speakers in this setup. Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to look at these speakers real quick. He's mostly considering either SVS or Arendelle for the speakers. Any thoughts on either of those? What uh, Would we go with something else? He's planning on bookshelf fronts, but if there's a bigger bookshelf and a smaller bookshelf, should he go with a bigger model because of the 14-foot seating distance? Uh, yeah, I would go... Now, just understand... In your case, especially since we're ha we're talking so much about you know so many restrictions and everything mm -hmm. else that you have going on here, I would always build a box of mm -hmm. of any bookshelf speaker that you're going to buy because agreed. Looking at them online does not ever translate into uh, realistic expectations of how big these things are going <laughs> to get. I've got uh, SVS Ultra bookshelves mm. in my They're theater. Pretty big. I love them, and they are large. Yeah. Uh, they are not small at all. They're also dusty. <laughs> but um, I would I would build a box mm. of, of each of these things just to make sure that everybody was okay with right. what, what, what you were going to buy. I mean, he has um, undoubtedly been watching YouTube videos because Arundel has been on a like a promotional tear making sure that all of the uh, YouTube influencers have Arundel speakers and are talking about them. I don't have a beef with them. They're a, uh, um, a coaxial... Uh, type of design, yeah, um, to but they're right they're big. Arundel doesn't make small speakers. I know they just brought out a smaller line. They're still big. I I don't really think that's what you want to go for. Honestly, again, I mean, similar to the ones we mentioned in the previous question. But I, my first thought here was Kef. I think Kef has what you need in terms of looks I, and going to yeah. be pretty good performance in this room. Well, so the coaxial design on the kefs yeah. uh, will help a little bit with some little of the bit, reflections, yeah. not not a lot. And you know, like you said, we're more looking towards them, excuse me, because of size yeah. than anything else. Um, you, know, you are sitting kind of far away. I doubt you're going to want to have it very loud because of how bouncy everything is going to yeah. be in this room. Um, you could also consider the HSUs. The you know, yep. anything horn loaded yep. would be good as far as uh, making sure you get to the volume you want to yep. get to cleanly, uh, without the physical size going nuts. Yeah, I would be. I would I highly, highly recommend that you take your wall color, mat you get it color matched to some room treatment, mm. you know, panel uh, fabric, and then get fab get panels made of that same fabric so that it looks the same. And literally Otherwise, anywhere you can in your room. We're, we're not everywhere. worried about specific spots anywhere that you can put some yeah. absorption in here. Uh, but I, I think if... That's going to make more difference than any speaker in any speaker choice you mm. make. Like, you're know, choosing between these speakers, you should choose them, I think, because you're going from just a sound bar to this. Anything is going to be better than what you currently <laughs> have, so you're going to be happy with it. I would choose it based on how well it's going to just physically fit, uh, making sure it's a, a reasonable performer. You you know you don't have to go crazy trying to you know get the you know audition a bunch of stuff. How it looks, how it fits, and making sure that it gets the volume you want it to to get to. Um, and then I would focus on treating the room. And then once you got the room to the point where 
you think maybe you can actually tell the difference between one speaker and another, <laughs> which is going to be a while, then I would start, you know, worrying about that. But that's going to be a while, I think. Uh, this room is, just doesn't lend itself very well to uh, all that all that stuff. And putting curtains up is really going to do uh, just barely more than zero. Acoustically, uh, yeah. Yeah, acoustically. So it will help keep the light out, though. All right, uh, Jeff. Jeff recently moved, and the movers killed his 65-inch TCL 6 Series TVs. There's a big star burst crack in the corner of the screen, and it won't ever even turn on. So he's getting a replacement. The house will have a separate dedicated theater in the loft. So this TV was meant to, for casual viewing in a very well-lit living room. He's got a $2,000 budget, and he wouldn't mind a size upgrade to 75 inches if it's affordable. For a big, bright room, what would we recommend? I mean, else your LCD TVs are going to be your best bet with however many zones of <laughs> dimmable backlight you can manage at a two thousand dollar budget. So I'm guessing TCL and Vizio are going to be our top recommendations. But I'm not looking at Rob's recommendations. Oh yeah, those purposely. are going to be up there. And he pointed <laughs> out he like he he immediately went looking at TCL. He's like, ah, they're out of stock all over the place. I'm like, yep. Yeah, they are. That's that's the, mm. the way things are at the beginning of this year. A lot of stuff out of stock. But the Vizios are in stock. And actually, the 75-inch Vizio P Quantum X, their top of the line that gets up to 2,700 nits. If you're worried about it being bright, yeah, I can sear your eyes out. Uh, it's on sale right now for $1,600 over at Best Buy. Uh, 1600 bucks wow. for a 75-inch top of the line Vizio. I'm like, I think you can kind of just stop there because the, the regular P series is only $100 dollars less uh because it's not right. on sale and the p quantum x is so it, there's no particular reason for a hundred bucks four hundred dollars for a mount yeah. i mean when, <laughs> when an hdmi cable that you'll when need. insurance <laughs> is paying for this by all means spend the extra hundred bucks uh so i mean i think your search can basically end there i'll mention that sony's x 900 h is available for exactly two thousand dollars in the 75 inch size i'd be very happy with that tv too but um yeah i'd probably grab that vizio p quantum x all right, Dan. Dan's got a 12 by 13 foot room with a 7.1.4 setup. And before Tom says anything yet, oh, sorry. Uh, he plans. <laughs> that should be yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. He plans to add a second SVS SB1000 sub to the front of his room so he'll have dual subs. As long as the other subs in the back. It is room. already in the back three. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> All right. Uh, at the moment, he's got six Orb audio speakers uh, in use as his surround backs, top, middles, and front heights. His five main speakers are Kef, Q series up front, and flat T series on walls for surrounds to the sides of the couch. Uh, okay, I'm scrolling. Which, through a bunch uh, of yeah, if uh, if our last listener is still listening, uh, that can be a look of what you're looking at. You could use Kef uh, flat sp yeah, speakers on those uh, flat back walls, and uh, and uh, Kef Q series up front would uh, work nicely as far as looks. So yes, Dan, we like that setup, and uh, yeah, we can see the Orb audio speakers all around up top. Yep, they are they are up there. Mm -hmm. I'm scrolling past all these guys. Okay, whatever. At one point, he tried a pair of SVS Prime Elevation speakers up high on the side walls as his top middles. If he could have put another pair of Prime Elevations on his front wall as front heights, he would have, but because of the shelves and crown molding on his front wall, he can't. The Prime Elevations and the Orb speakers sounded different enough to bother him, so he went back to all Orbs for heights. It's fine. But he says he would have gone all prime elevations if he could have. So do we think he should get another pair and then reposition all of his height speakers? Or another option would be to have one pair up high on the side walls, another pair as high as possible on the back wall, sort of like top, middles, rear heights. So what do you think we should do in this room? I think you've already got enough speakers in here and you should just stop. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't really know what those quote unquote surround backs are giving you right now. Yeah, I, yeah. I would. I mean, he's almost on the back. Yeah. back wall isn't he yeah. i mean he's right there he's pretty close to the I, back wall and yeah. I, i'd be i'd be okay with nixing those surround backs all together um look at rob coming around to my point of view <laughs> well no surround backs when, when it's appropriate yeah yeah um i agree with you though 100 those orb those orbs up above your head back there yeah. they are probably doing very little other than adding like a little bit of noise that doesn't really do anything for your right. sense of immersion. And so if um, you did that and then you got, say, prime elevation, because I mean, overall, it sounds like he preferred the sound of the prime elevations versus the orbs, but it just, you know, like physically didn't fit that well. If you were to then, instead of your surround backs, have rear heights, um, because I mean, it makes sense to have speakers that are as far back as you can. 
And right. then as far as putting a pair of prime elevation on the side walls, I'd want them like farther forward than where your orb sidewall ones are. Because, uh, I mean, you can't... Well, I, I don't know if you can configure something as top, middle, and rear heights. I don't think that's an option. Um, mm. But, I mean, even if you did, that that isn't what I would do. I'd want to have ones that are a little ways in front of me and then as far behind me as possible in your setup. So I don't know if you could move exactly where the ones on the side walls are, if you could move those forward at all. But if you could do that... I could, I could go with that, but I'd, I'd actually downgrade to a uh, 5.2.4 configuration. Yeah. So it looks like the... It, it looks like his middles, his top middles, mm -hmm. are actually in front of his couch. Just a little bit, yeah. yeah. seeing yeah. here. And um, first of all, I would I would just nix anything on that back wall completely. Okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put anything I'd be back okay there with at that all. Too. It, you're, you're right. I mean, even the top heights or whatever. Top, if you put something back there, I would call it top middles because okay. it's basically above your sure. head. So I would call it top middles. So you could use prime elevation speakers. Yeah. And like in again, place of what is currently being labeled your surround backs, you have yeah. prime elevations that are called top middles. And then farther forward than the current top middles on the sidewalls, put prime elevations still on the sidewalls, but call them front heights. <laughs> well, you, I mean, even the front, where your front heights are right now, they are, it's kind of hard to see, but they're right above Yeah, I mean, it seems molding. like he, for some reason, can't put things on the ceiling itself. He's 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 gone to lengths to do everything on the walls and even, like, hanging yeah. off of the molding at the front for the orb audios. I, I mean, if you can put stuff on the ceiling, you can now mount the prime yes. elevations on the ceiling. Yeah. So there's no reason why you couldn't, Put them up there as, if, as long as actual you can front mount heights. them. Yeah, yeah, as actual front heights. So, even with all that said, you know, I, that, this is the setup I have. I have a top middles mm -hmm. with prime elevations and front heights with prime elevations, and I'm still like meh about Atmos. Right. I know I notice it sometimes. It happens. It's been it's been known to happen, but uh, I don't know necessarily that it's something that I would ever say to somebody else. You should go out and do it. I was actually talking to Clint the other day about. Atmos speakers and he's like I am the perfect person this is what Clint told me I'm the perfect person for Atmos I've got all the tools I've got all the speakers <laughs> I've got access above my theater you know in the attic and everything very easy for me to mount all this stuff and he goes I just can't bring myself to do right. it <laughs> just, just, I just can't care enough to do it and I'm like you know what I think that's a really reasonable attitude to have about Atmos <laughs> right now. But uh, if you really do want to get, you know, uh, put elevation, the, the prime elevations, you know, get take all the orbs and just sell them. Right. And then replace them with two pairs of prime elevations and Bob's your uncle. That would be, that would be me. All right. Uh, so there you go. Yeah. Derek. Derek's room is wider than it is long. It's 18 feet by 13 feet. The entire right wall is the fascia for a fireplace and the left wall is uh, closet doors the entire back wall is shelves but he can put one of the his subwoofers somewhere along that back wall if we say that's best well we don't say it's best Todd Welty says it's best don't listen to us listen to him all right he's got a pair of clips r12 subs where should they go okay so he's drawing a picture he's got an l-shaped couch it faces a tv stand his uh speakers are 50 inches left and right from his the sure. center channel, yep. I guess. Yep. Looks like he's got a door in his front left corner, mm -hmm. and uh, there's closet doors along the left wall, the fireplace thingy on the right wall, and shelves behind him. So where should he put his sub? Well, I w you these are the options I would go with. Uh, front right corner, rear left corner. Pretty much. Yep. I would go. I would go to the either. You know, I would go second to. Uh, either side of your tv stand yes and then mirror it on the back wall meaning so if, if if it's just next to your front right speaker then look at the back wall and measure in from where you know from what from the well, on the right wall measure into your sub and then on your left wall on the back measure in and then to that same distance and put the sub there yeah the subs would still That's, be diagonally across from each other 
Yeah, that's the way I would do it. One of those two ways. Yep, I have to agree with that. I think that makes the most sense in here. You can't really do uh, midpoints of the two side walls. You can't really do midpoints of the front and back wall because your TV stand is right there. So we're going to go, yeah, just to either side of your TV stand, basically, including potentially into the front right corner, if that just makes the most sense. Front left corner doesn't make sense because that's your door. Uh, and then diagonally across from that on your back wall. Match it up. I, I, can I say I just love this picture? This picture. <laughs> so he, he's got lines notebook paper yeah. you know just like you had in, in school it looks like it's not even college ruled it looks like it's <laughs> it's wide ruled for like a little kid he's drawn the picture out and it's all perfectly reasonable but then he tore it and he and he he, he scratched a corner off the one of the corners <laughs> is torn off and then the 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 label for the door is smudged I, I there's just something endearing about this picture that i very much like i don't know what it is so uh yeah that's that's a great pitch uh he's got a 100 inch projection screen what is the best viewing distance oh math rob sure do the math uh well uh depends on what field of view you want of course i like a 45 degree field of view meaning that from straight ahead center my screen goes 22 and a half degrees to my left and 22 and a half degrees to my right and fills up that 45 degree field of view for that you would need to be Eight feet, nine inches from eyes to screen. That would give you that. Now, some people like a bigger field of view. They like a 50 degree field of view. For that, you'd be at seven feet, nine inches. And uh, about the smallest anybody would recommend for a movie theater screen is a 36 degree field of view. And for that, you'd be just over 11 feet away. So you're going to be somewhere in the range of about eight or nine feet, I would say, is sort of the butter zone. If you're in... That's where I would be. Yeah, if you're in 10 to 11 feet, that's still okay. If if you prefer to sit closer to the back of a theater, when, when you're able to go back to a movie theater, if your favorite seat was always close to the back and you like the screen to be a bit smaller, then maybe you'll be 10 to 11 feet away. Uh, but yeah, going to be somewhere right in that range. Right, right around uh, nine feet is about perfect. Right. So he's using five Yamo speakers uh, for the surrounds. How far back and how high above the seat should they go? I actually wrote an article on this the other day, but I haven't published it yet, so I can't <laughs> link it up here. But uh, so generally speaking, uh, you want the speakers to be directly to your sides. Okay. If you look at Dolby's most recent uh, updated suggestions, they have it either directly to your sides or just a tiny bit behind Yeah, as head. much as uh, plus or minus 110 degrees is sort right. of the most they recommend. So again, if straight ahead of you is the zero degree mark, 90 degrees is directly to the left or right, then a little bit farther back than that 100 or 110 degrees, particularly when it is a five speaker setup and not a seven, then they actually right. say you can have it 110 to 120 degrees. So it's a little ways behind you. Yeah. And then you want it uh, high enough so that the tweeter has a line of sight of everybody's ears. That's right. So, and, and whatever that height is. So when you're seated, when everybody's seated on the couch and in the seat, the, the way that they would seat, which means reclined or whatever, mm -hmm. look at the, where the speaker is, make sure the tweeter can see everybody's ear. Yep. And uh, so if it's on the left speaker, you want the right person on the right side of the couch, their ear to be able to, you know, have a clear sight, a clear shot to the tweeter yep and that's kind of where and that's typically going to be take your seated ear height which is often uh 38 inches or so is pretty typical although if you have low slung furniture it'll be lower if you have a high seat it'll be higher um and then about a foot and a half above that is typically where the the surround speakers will go and have a nice clear line of sight Jason. Jason got the Outlaw Audio OAW4 wireless kit on recommendation. He's using the transmitter and two of the receiving units for his dual subs. The subs sound very good when it's all working properly, but the sub at the back of the room, about 25 feet away from the transmitter, occasionally has noise or pops. It was worse on uh, Channel 4, bad enough that his wife ended up unplugging the sub entirely one day when he wasn't home. It seems uh, to be best on Channel 1, but it still has this interference and pops from time to time. Any ideas? That is, that is, that is, that is disappointing. It's picking up. It is disappointing. It's picking up something else that shouldn't be picking up. Right. And uh, we don't know. I mean, we can't know what it is uh, or why it is, uh, but that's, I don't think that there's a fix for that. I mean, that I can think of about all you I mean, could try. And I don't know how happy you're going to be with this idea, but um, yeah, I mean that receiver that's at the back of the room, that's picking up something from somewhere. Um, if you have any sort of inkling what that could be, you do have the option of 
it's still going to be wireless from the front of the room to the back of the room, but you take that little receiving unit and actually move it away from the subwoofer, away from the source of the interference. Then you end up, you know, running an RCA cable from the little receiving unit to the subwoofer still. It's going to be longer than the one that anyways. It's just going to be longer. Yeah. Yeah. That's about the only thing I can think of too, is like literally physically moving the receiver out. Because if it were me and I was doing this, I would probably just throw the, the receiver behind the, the sure. sub and think that that's perfectly fine and when it works it would be perfectly fine but it may be that you it's getting electromagnetic interference from the amplifier from the magnets mm. in the coil from something in the wall i mean who yeah. knows yeah so i think you physically have to move that thing that's about the only way you're going to be able to fix it yeah that i can think of yeah david David questions the way Rob described how to level match dual subwoofers in his 12-step guide. From the way David read it, the signal path gain from the AV receiver would remain the same, and you would measure the SPL from each sub one at a time at the main listening position and adjust the volume dials on each sub so they measure the same at the seat. The issue David has is that, for example, in his setup, the sub at the front of the room has a nasty dip in its response at 50 hertz, while the sub at the back of the room has a big peak at 50 hertz. If he uses the pink noise test tone, those big variances are enough to throw things off so much that the front sub ends up with its volume knob set too high and the back sub has its volume set too low. He's gone with the advice to gain matches two subs by putting them both in the same spot in his room one at a time and to set their uh, volume dials. Then he repositions one of them and proceeds from there. What do we think? I mean, that certainly can be the case. Yep. Uh, yeah. What he yeah, says yeah, is completely reasonable. And it's a it's yeah. a flaw in the simplified instructions I was giving, which was trying to be as broad and as general as possible. Uh, but yes, you've pointed out a, uh, a very realistic flaw that could occur. Um, now, the fix for that would be if you're aware of a particular bass frequency that doesn't have a big nasty dip and a big nasty hump anywhere in it. Like let's say at uh, 65 hertz, you know that both of them are actually pretty reasonable, that you're not getting a big hump or a big dip of either of them at 65 hertz. Then you could use just a 65 hertz tone to set the levels with the subwoofers where they're actually going to be positioned in the room, still just using an SPL meter at your seat. And you could do that. Now, we're going to reference what Todd Welty said, which is that if you're in a rectangular room and have them ideally positioned, um, he he would start with them both with the volume dials at the same spot. He wouldn't even level match them to the seat. He would have them beginning with the volumes equal and the phase knobs equal and a mono signal being sent to both and everything equal. But that's in an enclosed rectangular room with them at the midpoints of opposing walls, uh, which isn't necessarily going to be the case. And the reason I expanded beyond that in the 12-step guide. So I am still in favor of, um, because like to me, it doesn't make sense to say, put one at the front of the room get its level set, then put the second sub at the front of the room, get its level set, then move the second sub to the back of the room. Because that still might be considerably off in how things sound right, at your seat, which right. unless your seat is exactly in the middle of the room, and we don't really want to do that. Um, so I, I'm still in favor of, of going along with mine, but you have pointed out a valid flaw, which is that I did say to use the built-in test tone of the uh, AV receiver, which is you know pink noise or white noise. That's all frequencies coming out of the signal equally. If you have some massive hump and some massive dip, that could be enough to throw things off, at which point the fix is to use a single tone that you have basically kind of confirmed. It can be just with your ears. You know, you play a sweep, you go, okay, at this point in the sweep, they both sound reasonable. There's no giant hump or dip uh, in either location and just use that single tone. Okay. I was going to write something, but now I can't. Cameron, <laughs> before he had a chance to hear our advice last week, uh, Cameron spoke with a customer service at SVS, Gick and RSL. He was very impressed with all of them. And even though he had bought his SVS PP2000 Pro at Best Buy, SVS still sent him the original port plugs for free since he wanted to try them out. Good. Yeah. We stress that he should treat his back wall as much as possible with acoustic treatments. Gick's, Gick also said his back wall is a top priority, but they further stressed that he ought to base trap in his two rear corners as much as possible and then focus on treating his side walls after that. Do we agree? Uh, I mean, I think that this is... <laughs> I, I, I don't 
necessarily have to argue too much about the order of operations here. (laughs) I think both these things have to happen. Sure. Um, If you were going to choose one, I would do the front. I would do the wall before I did the corners. The back wall. The back wall, right? Yeah, I would do the back wall before Mm -hmm. I did the before I did the 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 two corners. And Gip doesn't seem to be disagreeing with that uh, uh, about that with us. So uh, yeah, we're both in agreement there. That back wall is your number one. Yeah. Um, oh, I think I think it was just because yeah we came to base trapping a little bit after and they were like that's yeah the, maybe. that's the second priority is the base trapping I don't disagree with them I, I agree with them that base trapping wherever you can do it is going to be beneficial so uh, I don't think there's any real disagreement here we're, we're all coming at this maybe in ever so slightly different orders that we listed it uh, but we all want to get you to the same spot right I see I guess for me you know like. That the order of operations. Well, okay, so you do the back wall, then you do the corners, and then you do the side walls. Or you do the back wall, then you do the side walls, then you do corners. Right. I think what's going to end up happening is it's all going to get done. Right. So <laughs> just do it in the order that makes the sense for your budget. Sure. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Like if you can if you can do all of it at once, Bob's your uncle. Okay. You're done. Okay. <laughs> but if you can only do you know, I can, I can afford the, the back wall and the side walls, but not the corners all at the same time. Or I can afford the side walls and the corners, but not the back wall. Do the back wall and then whatever else you can afford <laughs> and then get the rest of it as soon as you can afford it. You know, this is not something that you're going to be like, well, I'll live with this for a couple of years. No, <laughs> you're going to live with this until you can afford the rest of it. And then that's when you buy it. So I, I don't really think that there's there, there's much to argue no, about here. No, no, he's, he's just confirming because he's he's learning yeah. as he goes. And this is yeah. the first time he's going to like full fully separate speakers and all that and tricking out the room. I don't mind that at all. Yeah. I, I, don't, I agree completely. RSL told him that even though the, his Klipsch towers are physically large, he ought to give them an 80 hertz crossover and set the crossover for all of his other speakers to 80 as well. But then they looked up his Revel M8 on-wall speak, uh, surrounds and they are very weak in their base. And so to set them at 110 hertz and since their surrounds, it shouldn't be a big issue. Cameron was disappointed to hear that surround, about that about the surrounds. But do we agree with all that crossover advice or should you be set uh, sh- or should anything be set differently from what RSL said? I think you should let your receiver set all these crossovers. And if it sets it lower than 80, bump it up to 80. That's what I would do. <laughs> well, and it almost uh, certainly will set yeah, those clips yeah. towers to a cross. It might set them to full range, very likely, uh, set them to yeah. large. Or uh, if it does set them to small, it'll probably give them a 40 or 60 hertz crossover. Honestly, um, I mean, very often we come across advice from manufacturers and retailers and we're like, oh, got to go through that because, you know, they said one thing right and a whole bunch of things wrong. Uh, this advice I'm on board with. I think they steered you absolutely correct. Um, I agree with Tom. You're going to run your Odyssey room correction first. It's going to set crossovers where, where it wants to, whether you want to or not. Um, but after that, I think RSL's advice is spot on. Anything that was set lower, if it was set to large, change it to small. If it was set yeah. lower than 80 hertz, move it to 80 hertz. And I am 100% in agreement with those Revel M8s. They need to be set at 110 or 120. They have nothing below 110 or 120. Um, and as so, surrounds, it's no problem having them set to a higher crossover than your fronts. No right, problem right. at all. Yeah. I, what RSL did is the exact same thing we would have done, which mm. is we looked. They, they looked at the specs and they said, this has a negative 3 dB down to about 110 yeah. hertz. So set the crossover there. And that's that's what we would have done. And but their initial advice, which is set it everything to eighty, is also what we said yep. all the time. <laughs> you know, so they said absolutely nothing different than we would have said. So RSL is now my new favorite company. <laughs> sorry, sorry, SVS. <laughs> You guys still have that stupid thing that on your website that matches their subwoofer based on how much they spend ah, on their, right, yeah. their speakers. So until you fix that, <laughs> RSL is my favorite. <laughs> Lieutenant Sulu. Uh, it's it's not really George Takei, is it? It is not. It's, 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 he said he would have chosen the uh, screen handle Spock, but it was already taken. So he became Lieutenant oh, Sulu. <laughs> All right. First up, those giant DJ speakers at the back of the room were for karaoke, and he was borrow- borrowing them for his brother uh, from his brother-in-law. They are not a permanent fixture. Oh yeah, this is the guy who had like the weird speakers at the back <laughs> yeah. of the room. So we're like, are those surround backs? They they. So could now be, I think Lieutenant Sulu is, is Korean because I, I, I've always seen speakers like that in restaurants and at Korean restaurants and, ah. for whatever reason. So I've decided you're Korean. <laughs> that may or may not be true. I will tell you, I love your food. It's like my favorite. I could eat Korean every day of the week, though my stomach can't handle it. I like the spicy stuff. So as he described last time, he's got three B&W speakers up front. He's currently got a pair of Boston Soundware uh, 4.5 speakers mounted on the ceiling as surrounds. Then he has one pair of B&W in-ceiling speakers on hand, but they aren't installed yet. 
We said that we were in favor of stopping at 5.1.4 setup. He'd like to know if we think he should keep the Boston Soundware speakers, should he continue using those as surrounds and to get another pair of B&W in-ceiling so they can have four in-ceiling speakers for Atmos? Should he get a pair of B&W bookshelf speakers to use as surrounds instead of the Boston Soundwares? And if he replaces the Boston speakers as surrounds, should he take them down completely or could he still use them as some other speaker pair? Let's take a little closer look here. So his side, his side surrounds are on the ceiling. Yes. Uh, kind of pointing at his couch, which he does. Yeah, I guess those are the Boston really soundwares. They're mounted to his ceiling, uh, but those are, are his surrounds. Yeah. yeah, they're right above him. <laughs> so if you, so this is what I'm going to say. Yeah. All right. You can't get any more Bostons. So those are gone. So okay. what you got is what you got. So the question is whether or not you're going to, what you're going to do with what you currently have. Mm -hmm. If this is an option, what does he say? If you can get a pair of B&W or any speakers to use as surrounds and they can be to the sides of your couch or maybe yeah. direct, you know, and he did mention last behind. time he actually already has a pair of B&W stands. So he's got stands, but no additional pair of bookshelf speakers. And I'm like, yeah, you, you use those stands, you buy yourself a pair of B&W bookshelf speakers, and they yeah. go on those stands to the left and right of your couch as your new surround speakers, more or less, at your level. And now you have top middles, which you already are already up there. You already have top middles, <laughs> which are your Boston Soundwares. I would no longer point them at the seat. I would point them straight down. Straight down, right. Mm -hmm. And then I, you could install front heights. Yeah. As, I mean, uh, the B&W in ceilings the B &W that he ones. has, you install those towards the front of your room in your ceiling. And, will there yeah. be a perfect timbre match? They will and. not, but they are Atmos speakers and nobody cares. Right. So I, 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 that is what I would do. Five point, however many point four. Yes. I guess, is it one and two? I don't remember. He's got 5.1. Yeah, I set, wouldn't but. worry about your four overhead speakers all perfectly matching. I wouldn't take down your Boston Soundwares. I'd leave them where they are. I'd just change the angle on their mount so they're firing straight down, but they will become your new top middle, or you could call them top rear speakers. That would, I mean, for the label, doesn't really matter. It's front and back. Uh, and I would, the only thing I would buy is a pair of BNW bookshelf speakers, put them on the stands you said you already have to the left and right of your couch. So in terms of wiring his Integra 11.2 channel prepo, he was thinking that with in-ceiling Atmos speakers, he'd end up calling them uh, top fronts and top rears, but fine. the pre-outs on the Integra are labeled height one and height two. So do the names have to match? <laughs> Does it matter which pre-outs get plugged into which amps and speakers? Uh, well, so height one and height two. Like the on, on, if you look on the back of the pre-pro itself, yeah. those names are etched in there, right? Height one and height right. two. That's what the pre-outs say. But as long as you can assign what the height one is and what height two is right. to whatever, then it doesn't matter. You could call it uh, Hansel and Gretel. I mm -hmm. mean, it, does, it, it doesn't matter what it says on the back of the thing. Yeah, they as could long have as just you can assign labeled it. the pre-out plugs A, B, C, D, E, F, G. They, they could have done that. And right. then you're assigning what pre-outs. So the, the pre-outs have their names, height one and height two. That's fine. And we're going to say that the height one speakers are my top front speakers and the height two speakers are my top rear speakers. Uh, you don't right. have to call them heights in the labels of the setup menu just because the name that's etched physically on the back right. says height one and height two. That's just a label to let you know, okay, these are my height one pre-outs. What signal are they sending? They're sending the top front signal. These are the height right. two pre-outs. What signal are they sending? They're sending the top rear or signal. Or vice versa. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> so you that... actually have that option. I'm pretty sure well, that I mean, height yeah. one gets us assigned to whatever is frontmost, and height two gets assigned to whatever is rearmost. I don't the, think you have full The point being that the the electronics inside the receiver does not care right. what is etched on the outside of it. No. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you, as long as you can assign it the right to the right thing, then you'll be fine. So if he stops at 5.1.4, but the surround speakers are, act are actually positioned a little bit behind him, should he use the surround back pre-outs on his Integra instead of the surround pre-outs? You won't be able to. Correct. <laughs> I mean, you could, but it will not be correct. <laughs> There'll be no sound coming out of it. Yeah, when you, run, <laughs> when you run your auto setup, it'll play sounds out of the surround channels and right. no sounds will play because you wouldn't yeah. have any speakers connected to them. Then it'll try yeah. to play something out of surround backs and sounds will be there, but then it'll say, you should have surrounds if you're going to have surround backs yeah. Yeah. 
So it's one of those cases where it's an if then mm, statement. Right. You know, if you if you have surrounds, then you can have surround backs. But right. if you do not have surrounds, you cannot have surround backs. Correct. No, there's no receiver on the market that will allow you to have surround backs and not surrounds. Yeah. It just. I can see where he's thinking because he's looking at the names that are etched on the back, yeah. and he's trying to line up the names that are etched onto the pre-out plugs to the positions of the speakers. That isn't the way it is. Like I say, just imagine that on the back of your Integra Pre Pro, the the pre-outs were just labeled A B C D. EFG. If you think of right. it that way, then it's just what signal are they outputting? And, and yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I did, I, and I haven't published this article yet, but I did write it, and I already mentioned it, that I wrote the article about uh, pos- you know positioning your surround speakers mm. and, your, and your Atmos speakers and stuff like that. And by God, if, if I looked at all of these different diagrams <laughs> that are out I'm there right. on, on speaker, right. they are just so atrociously right. bad. I mean, the speakers are all aiming towards the 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 one one oh, p- person yes. in the one yep. seat. Oftentimes, they're positioned in the room so that you can see the labels <laughs> and not actually where they physically go mm-hmm. in the room. Like they have the surround back speakers in the back back corners, yeah. and the surround speakers look like they're in front of the couch. I mean, it is so confusing. So I do not begrudge anybody wondering these things because I look at those diagrams and go, "Well, who the heck?" <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And we know which, we know which is right and which is wrong and what they got right and what they got wrong. But I mean, if you're looking up the information because you right. don't know, then yeah, what the heck is what? And, and they're it, conflicting depending on which one you look no, at. It, you look at Dolby's own website. Right. This is the people that came out with the thing and their diagrams. The best one I could find still had the, all the speakers aiming in sure. weird you know drawers. The, the couch which was wrong, yeah. and uh, but they actually it, they actually had the 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 rear height speakers like ah, co-located right. with the surround backs yeah. i'm like is your is your room like 17 feet tall is that why they're back there i mean like yeah. why are they back why are they back and it's just so confusing so i completely understand these questions all right infinite gary as we know, Gary owns many displays and has many uh, several setups throughout his house. One of the displays is an early OLED model back when they were still 1080p and we and we didn't have HDR yet. He also still has a Pioneer Kuro Plasma. When he compares that 1080p OLED to his Kuro, the Kuro seems to show more shades and a variety and variety of color. Is that a matter of it covering more of the color spectrum? What is the technical explanation for the visible difference? Well, the technical explanation is that you got an early version of one TV and compared it it's the best version of another <laughs> TV technology and said, so how come they don't look the, this newer one, which is physically newer, but uh, also, or also, you know, one of the earliest examples of that technology and comparing it to one of the best examples of an older technology. I would fully expect the older technology to look better uh, simply because OLED was not yet uh, uh, matured and optimized <laughs> as much as it is now. So uh, the first thing we have to cover is, were you comparing these side by side in the same room under the same lighting conditions? Because if you're yeah, walking yeah. from one room to another room, even if you think, oh, the lighting doesn't look that different in this room compared to that other room. Oh, no, that, that you can the way your eye perceives color can be heavily biased right. by the ambient light in the rooms. I don't know if that's the case. I know Gary does move things around in his house to do these types of side-by-side comparisons, so it's entirely possible it was same room and same lighting conditions, and he still saw this difference. But if it wasn't, if it was you you moved from room to room yourself and made this comparison, then it's not truly a valid comparison because your human eye could be easily biased. The main difference that's going on here is that the OLEDs don't have three subpixels. They don't have red, green, blue. They have four. They have red, green, blue, white. In order to add extra brightness to it, they engage the white subpixel, which actually desaturates all of your colors a little bit. And I'm betting that's most of it, if if it was that you were comparing them side by side, same lighting conditions. That is primarily responsible. There's also some difference between the pulse way that plasmas display colors, where they flash 600 times a second. Uh, let me see. No, six... Is it? Yeah, 600 times a second, yeah, uh, where they flash and they go flash, 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 flash to create the colors. And there's actually a gap in between one color and right. the next. Whereas on an OLED, it's a sample and hold. One color is there until the next color shows up. And there's actually a moment there where your eye blends those colors together. There's a transition lag in your human perception system. It's not the TV's fault. That's how your human eye sees it. Whereas the plasma has a flash in between and a full blackness from one color to the next. And that can 
alter the way that we perceive the color on the OLED right. because we're merging two colors side by side for that little moment. So there's technical reasons why you can see it. It's probably mostly that white subpixel. <laughs> there's an article out there that, that it's, it's old and you, you can find it and I, I didn't write it, but the, the writer goes through and explains how that flashing of plasmas will always be superior right. as far as you know color separation and motion and all this other stuff because our eye has an because of the flashes and the the little blackness in mm -hmm. between each one it our eye is better at putting those things together as motion than the sample and the the, the, the sample and hold mm -hmm. method where that transition can never be fast enough that's right for us not to smear it a little bit our eyes to smear it a little bit it's a very interesting very technical article you will like it i don't know where it is maybe <laughs> rob will find it and put it in the, in the show notes but it's very long it goes through all of this this really technical stuff but the 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 too long didn't read version is oled all these lcd type of technologies where it's a sample and hold have the same problem with uh with that one small moment of transition never being fast enough for our eye not to basically right. see both things at the same time. So there's that. Jonathan in Montreal. Jonathan has heard us say that you can use just about any speakers for the front for the four overhead atmos positions that they don't need to perfectly match your five or seven main speakers. But he has power sound audio, extremely high efficiency speakers all around and two gigantic massive output subwoofers. He isn't keen to import four more power sound audio speakers in an attempt to attach them to a ceiling. Even for his taste, that seems like overkill. But could something like the SVS Prime Elevation speakers honestly still work? What are our thoughts about maybe using clips wedge-shaped Atmos speakers. All right, so this comes up often when we talk about differences in uh, efficiency mm -hmm. with speakers. The problem isn't tamper matching. That is not what you should be worried about. What you should be worried about is whether or not you can level match right. these less efficient <laughs> speakers to your more efficient speakers. Now, the benefit is that the overhead speakers are physically much closer to you mm -hmm. than your other speakers. So, Although... It doesn't necessarily, like if somebody's got them on their front wall as front heights, right. they might, right, they right, might right. be actually even farther away than the front because of the you know, hypotenuse, right? So <laughs> it's So it's a long possible. time ago, I, I had a friend who uh, has has since passed away, but he was an installer. His name was Ray. He, he sometimes wrote for Audioholics uh, back in the day. And I called him one time because I had a friend who had clip speakers and he wanted to get some uh, surround backs. And I was asking him about, you know, what, what you should get. And, and we came, this, we came across the same thing mm. where he said his, his, his speakers will be too, because of that size of the room, they'll be too far back and he won't be able to level match them. Mm. So depending on where you're going to put your speakers will highly affect whether or not you can level match the, the less efficient speakers with your more efficient speakers. I would, if it were me, probably opt for the clips yep. because they're horn loaded, they're more efficient and uh would probably have you would be much more likely to be successful level matching them than you would be with uh with the with the svs speakers yeah. that's my just my without knowing anything more about your setup that's about all i can say yeah there's like really no downside to you getting the clips at most speakers right. the ones that are wedge shaped right. and meant to go uh up on the wall they they're uh, you can use them up firing but they have a physical switch where you can choose whether you're up firing them or have them mounted high up on a wall uh so uh, there's not really any downside with going for the clips instead uh they're gonna have that higher efficiency there's a Reason I'm assuming you went for power sound audio and these very efficient, uh, high yeah. sensitivity speakers and matching those. It's gotta those be a with... big room, right? It's gotta be a massive yeah, room. It's yeah. the only thing I can think. So ma yeah. matching those with Klipsch to me is the right way to go here. And I mean, price wise, form factor wise, they're right in line with the SVS Prime elevations. Yeah. So I don't have any problem doing that. But I mean, you've pointed out a good scenario where it's like, yeah, it's not that it completely absolutely never matters what you put overhead uh it, right. you do want to have some reasonable match to the rest of your system and and clip share is the perfect solution all right i have to leave in 10 minutes i have to be right. in my car in 10 minutes so we can try to do wayne but we're gonna have to we're gonna have to hustle here okay yeah let's so do that. wayne's room is 11 feet wide 18 feet long and nine feet high the main seats are 11 feet from his 65 inch sony that's too small and the room is pre-wired for 5.1.2 setup he's got an elac debut speakers up front mica in wall and in ceilings for surrounds on the back wall and at most top middles the front speakers are all in a custom entertainment cabinet which is definitely staying they like the look but the 
Elex subwoofer, just the one for now, had to move out of that cabinet because of rattles. It's now on the right side wall just in front of the door, and that placement actually seemed to be a big improvement in terms of bass sounding even across the seats. I would guess so yes <laughs> compared to in please the entertainment center please yeah. don't put anything in entertainment center centers uh a weird one to start wayne says that when he runs uh, mcacc on his pioneer lx501 receiver the front speaker tests tones sound fine but the surrounds and the atmos speakers uh the left uh the left test tones come out of the right side speakers and vice versa he says he switched the speaker wires at the receiver end but it made no difference <laughs> Could the installer who did the pre-wiring have done something weird enough to cause? If you can switch the wires and it doesn't make a difference, your receiver is possessed. That and I, I, that I, makes... I, it, that's physically that's physically impossible. Yes, I, that is not possible. I'm All sorry. I was thinking that that might have happened here is that he took the surround right and yes. switched it with the top middle right. Right. You got to switch left, the, the rights and the lefts, not the rights and the I rights. I mean, that's and the, that's the, and the only lefts. thing I could think of because, I mean, yeah. so, I mean, look, the, the you I did not switch the speaker wires. Yeah, the, <laughs> I mean, the, the idea, like maybe the installer labeled the speaker wires and said, this is your surround left and this is your surround right. And when you actually connect them the way the labels are, the surround left channel comes out of the surround right speaker. That's an easy mistake to make that's because if mistake, you're yeah. facing the back of the room instead of facing the front of the room, when you put the labels on, then the left and right are going to be switched. This but is if, what... This is what you do, okay? You grab a AAA battery, okay, <laughs> and you you unplug all the all the overheads and surround speakers. You grab a AAA battery, you grab a wire. I don't care which wire it is, and then you put the the AAA battery, you know, the the wire, uh, you know, the black and the red or white mm -hmm. and red or whatever to either side of the AAA battery, and it's going to make a speaker make a thumping kind of sound. It's going right. to okay. Then you have somebody else walk around the room and tell you what speaker is making that sound, <laughs> and then you plug that in to the correct output on your yeah. receiver and you do it for all your speakers that way you will know for sure that you've got the right stuff plugged into the right ignore what the labels say that right. the wires and the receiver does not care what it says what your how your you know, installer and you know uh labeled these wires because they can't read they're <laughs> dumb so well, like i say it's, it, it's a mistake we've all made where we we yeah. connected the surround right to the you know uh surround left channel because we were facing the back of the room i think that's the left uh, but yeah. yeah, there's no way yeah, that but... if you switch the surround right and the surround left at the receiver that it stayed in the same. <laughs> there's no way to wire that and make that happen. So I'm I'm thinking it was some user error along the way. Yeah. So if he gets a second sub, he says the right rear uh, corner is about the only place it could go, and it would have to be have to use a wireless connection. But he already has his first sub on the right wall. So what are our thoughts? I mean, it, it's un it's impossible for us to predict how that's going to sound. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not necessarily going to be. Now Great, I'm like, so. I, I I can't entirely see why he can't move the sub that's at the front of the room to the left, like in front of his sliding glass door there, because there's right. open wall space on the left-hand side of the room, very similar to the right-hand side of the room. If you could do that, and then you have your second subwoofer in the rear right corner, that should work pretty darn well. Yeah, that's, that's what I would suggest, yeah. too. Uh, the only acoustic treatment in the room is a rug on the floor. It's, he, he's very open to having panels on the side walls at the first reflection points, but most of the back wall is taken up with a window. Would it make sense to treat above and below the window? Anything else uh, we would do in, uh, in terms of acoustic treatments? This is, again, one of those rooms where it really doesn't matter what you, where you put it because there's not a whole lot of places to put it. Mm -hmm. So wherever you have a place and you are willing to put a panel, I would put it there. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know... As much as possible. It looks like there's space in the front left corner for his sub too. Why can't it just go in that front left corner to the left yeah. of the of, of the of the It might not thing. fit. It might just be a little bit too squishy to fit there. That's possible. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, I mean you've got pictures on your side walls both at the front of the room and towards the back of the room. Those could be become printed panels so that you actually yeah. have uh, acoustic panels uh, on the side walls at the front and back. In here, you know, you're not gonna get to thirty percent of this room covered. But the the closer you can get to 30%, the better. Uh, could you have panels above and below the window? Absolutely, yes. It'll help knock down some of the reverberation that's in this room. No problem doing that. So he has a, a Roku Ultra, and when he tries to watch HBO Max, he can browse just fine. But when he pushes play, the TV screen goes black. It seems like everything is attempting to start the movie, but then it fails and just goes back to the selection screen. If he uses the HBO Max app that's built into his TV, it works fine. So any ideas what's up with his Roku? I will say that it is because your Roku sees your receiver, and your receiver says it can do a certain thing and then the TV can't do the thing that the receiver can do. So the Roku connects to the receiver and says, okay, I'll send you what you want. The receiver tries to send it out to the 
to the TV and the TV says, oh, I can't do that. And that messes everything up. And that That's is my guess. very, very possible with his Pioneer LX501 because only three of the six HDMI inputs support 4K on that LX501. Only yeah. inputs one, two, and three have HDCP 2.2 and support 4K output. Uh, the other ones are HDCP 1.4 and are meant for 1080p inputs. Uh, so if there's any chance that you plugged your Roku Ultra into ports four, five, or six on the back of your Pioneer, that would explain what's going on here. So in a different room, he's using a Denon S950H. He has a Sonus Connect, and he uses Denon Zone 2 to power a pair of in-ceiling speakers. In a previous house, he had the Sonos Connect plugged into the into a Dayton amplifier, and when he would play some music on the Sonos, the Dayton amp would automatically wake up, and that all worked nicely. Is there a way to get the Denon receiver to wake up and power up at zone two whenever he plays something on the Sonos? At the moment, he has to power on the Denon first, which is a bit of a hassle. That's not really the direction that 12 volt triggers tend to work. Um, no. And that's, that's the way that you would have to do that. Uh, really, what you need need would be uh that was air quotes is a harmony setup even a very simple you know remote control that when you press you know play music on whatever it does a simple macro which turns on your receiver for you and then vice versa when you turn it off that's what you need or you just need to turn on your denon and <laughs> get over it like the thing <laughs> is, is i, I assume one. what's happening is that they're used to using sonos on their house which makes sense plenty of people yep. are that that means you're pulling up the sonos app because that's pretty much the only way that you're going to be doing that so the denon receiver that you have uh it has an app it's it's the heos control app and within that you can turn on the denon and and set it to zone two um so i mean it would require you going to the denon app first to the heos app first uh, and then going over to the Sonos app. I mean, you could also just transition to Heos would be one option. But I mean, right. if you're also using it with your Pioneer receiver, then then Heos isn't going to go across both of those things. That's probably why he settled on Sonos. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is an extra step, but there, it's not going to be like the reason why it worked with your Dayton amplifier is because it had signal auto sensing. Whenever a signal came into its RCA inputs, the Den uh, Dayton amp automatically wakes up because it has automatic signal sensing. Uh, the Denon doesn't have that. The, there isn't really a way to, to do exactly that. So the best I can say is that if you, if you aren't, or aren't already using the Denon Heos app, uh, maybe you weren't even aware that it had the thing, that that's the way to do things convenient. Because if you're already pulling up your phone to get to the Sonos app, then you're just going to go to the Den and Heos app first, turn that on that way, and then go to your Sonos app. Uh, but yeah, that's about the best you can do there if you're not going to have a, a whole macro system. Right. All right. Uh, who do we have left? We have Brian, who also asked several questions about a basement setup. Rob X, Matt C, and Julian is back again from the UK. Okay. I'm going to thank uh, our listeners of the week. We're going to thank Dan, Jose, Nathan for going to avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and leaving us a PayPal donation, as well as our 126 patrons over at patreon.com. That's right. Dan, Jose, and Nathan, thank you so much for those PayPal donations. Really appreciate that. And patreon.com slash podcast for anyone who would like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation. Thanks so much to our 126 patrons over there. I want to thank Jason for uh, talking us up to Accessories for Less and Gick, and Michael for talking us up for Gick, Bertrand for sending Rob a gift card, Nicholas uh, for mentioning us in their the Linus Tech Tips video, Dan uh, for sending me some photos, and the notes of gratitude from Rob, a K, Andrew, Patrick, Dan, Car Cameron. God, that spelling messes me up every time. Christian, Jason, Jonathan, Nathan, Vince, Wayne, Gorinder, and Brian. Wow, that's a lot of names, but I'll try to repeat them. Uh, Jason and Michael, thank you for talking us up to Gig. Jason, also, thanks for talking us up to Accessories for Less. Bertrand, thank you very much for that Amazon gift card. Uh, Nicholas, yeah, thanks very much for adding that wonderful shout out at the end of the Linus Tech Tips video. Hopefully more people will find us. That'd be cool. Dan, for th uh, thanks for letting Tom use those photos that you sent in. And then Rob, Andrew, Patrick, Dan, Cameron, Christian, Jason, Jonathan, Nathan, Vince, Wayne, Gurinder, and Brian. Thank you all very much for the notes of gratitude and encouragement. Really do appreciate it. And thank you to everyone everybody for continuing to listen and sending in your questions. And if you want your question answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now stay in and listen to something.
Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. Now go out and listen to something.